Can you hear me and see my screen okay? Yeah? Okay. So just, just a reminder as, as uh, we're going to get started soon, please mute yourself as you uh, come in. Um, so welcome everyone to today's morning, afternoon or evening session, depending on where you are. Uh, today's session is going to focus on geohazard, and we have the next four hours to cover, to cover this vast topic. My name is uh, Anne Bessel from the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and I'm one of the conveners for this session. And the other, the other conveners are uh, Jinhua Gong from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Andre from Oregon State University and Patrick Hart from USGS Santa Cruz, but unfortunately he couldn't be with us today. And I would like to thank them for helping organizing this session. And again, I'd like to give a big shout out to Casey Adaho from IRIS. She has been, she's put an incredible amount of work and energy to plan on and organize this uh, symposium. So thank you, um, Casey. And I would like to thank Casey's team as well, Molly Stats and uh, Christine Patra. And I um, guess uh, most of you have already had a look at the, the agenda for today's session, but I wanted to point out a few things. So in this session, we are going to cover four main topics, volcanic hazard, the global tsunami warning and mitigation system, long-term or permanent seafloor observatories, and slope stability and fluid flow, although there are like some obvious overlaps between these topics. And uh, for each topic, um, there would be one or two keynote type lecture that would be 20 minutes long, followed by 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. And most of the keynote lect lecture would be followed by shorter talks and shorter Q&A session. And I, I also wanted to point out that this section, with this session will feature work from early career scientists, including graduate students and more senior scientists. And I thought it was important to mention. We've also allocated uh, 15 minutes for open discussion on each topic. And I'll be the moderator uh, for, the, for our first topic. So for the 10 uh, minute Q&A following the first talk, if you have any question, you can either raise your hand and I will be calling you or you can type your question in the chat and I'm going to read it. But when we will start the open discussion, I would like you to use only um, the chat feature. And um, so if you could just type your question in the chat and I'll uh, read it, or you, you just indicate that you would like to ask a question. And it would be great if you could just add also if it's related to the discussion um, we are having by typing it just a R at the beginning or an R if it's not related. And there are a few topics that I would like to cover in uh, the discussion, including rapid, resp rapid response and permanent observatory. But if you have any announcement to, announcement to make, just feel free to chime in. So now I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen. And um, I'm going to turn it to uh, turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Moelia Urlaoff. So Moelia uh, is a research scientist at Guillaume Helmut Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, Germany. And today she's going to talk to us about the very nice work she has been doing uh, on Mount Etna using absolute pressure gauge data and a large uh, ERC project she is part of and that is led by uh, Marc-André Gutscher from Ifremer. So take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, I just need to get myself organized, just a second. Okay. So can you see my screen? Good, thank you. So yeah, thank you. And for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to give this keynote lecture. Um, I'm really glad I can do that. And um, I want to highlight how marine seismology or maybe marine research in more general can contribute to assessing volcanic hazards like in this case flank collapses. And I think one reason directly it becomes clear when looking at this picture in the background is that the largest part of ocean island volcanoes are, is below water. So I'm showing here um, Stromboli, 
volcano in and everything that's green is above this the sea and everything that's blue is um is below the sea and it's also in the water where the largest threat of um flank instabilities and flank collapses is that is the tsunami um, but i want to take it a little further than just looking at this picture and really demonstrate how important marine research is by showing evidence that volcanic processes are shoreline crossing processes and that only by considering the entire volcano onshore and offshore we get a true understanding of the system of the volcano system so i've laid out the take-home message of my talk but um yeah let's get into it and what other example to set the scene with than the eruption and collapse of Anak Krakatau in December 2018. So the collapse reduced um, the height of the island um, from a bit from uh, around 340 meters down to a bit over 100 meters and um, the landslide that um, that resulted from the collapse caused a tsunami that killed more than 400 people um, around the shore of um, the Sanda Strait. So the event demonstrated how far-reaching consequences such flank collapses have, um, especially when they occur um, on volcanoes that are surrounded by water. And however, it must be noted that this event, so the Anak Krakatau collapse, was a rather small event when compared with um, the geological records that we have from other places um, at the seafloor. So I'm showing here two um, maps that are plotted ex at exactly the same scale. And you can see Anak Krakatau in this tiny, um, this tiny little blob here. And um, for compar comparison, this is Oahu um, in Hawaii. And we can see um, the litter or the debris of um, a flank collapse um, at the seafloor here. And just single blocks are much, much larger than the whole island of, of Krakatau. So um, the tsunami that must have been caused by this event must have been extreme. And what are we, what are we actually doing about, about this problem? Or do we actually care? And um, yes. So there is um, monitoring in place at uh, a few volcanoes. So I'm showing here three. Um, it's Kilauea in Hawaii, Piton de la Fonese at La Réunion, and um, Etna in southern Italy. And it must be said that they are among these three volcanoes are among the best monitored volcanoes in the world. And what they have in common is they all have unstable flanks meaning that um, a chunk of the volcano is behaving or is deforming anomalously in that it is slowly slipping downwards. And interestingly, for all these volcanoes, um, the, the unstable flanks are slipping into the sea. So this is indicated by um, the GPS vectors um, here for all three volcanoes. And another um, uh, feature that they have in common is that it appears that um, the largest uh, deformation is at the shoreline. So because uh, the volcano obviously doesn't stop at the shoreline, um, deformation probably doesn't stop either. So however, the, um, the fact that we only have onshore ground deformation, which is only covering a very minor part of, of many of the volcanoes, um, means that offshore slip is highly unconstrained and that results in high uncertainties in the models that seek to fit the onshore GPS and um, inside data. So um, here is an example uh, from the 2018 um, seismic uh, event. So it was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake at Kilauea and the slip model that fits the GPS displacement um, also predicts the largest slip offshore. So you have um, the land with the GPS uh, vectors here in well, everything on the land is gray. 
And, um, but actually the largest slip is in the offshore where we don't have any proper constraints or the largest slip is predicted to be offshore. So another example comes um, from Etna, where uh, Bruno et al modeled GPS data for an inflation phase. So that was a bit more than a year. And for orientation, this is the summit. This is the coastline here in the, bleak, in the big, um, the bold black line. And um, they, the authors predict a huge slip up to 25 centimeters offshore. Here, the dark blue boxes. And that is also highly unconstrained. And that this, um, this may have fa fatal consequences. I would like to show um, by moving again back to Anakrakatau. So I'm uh, showing here a map view of the island. You can see how it looks like on the pictures on the right. And um, the colors indicate the line of site displacement rate averaged over the years 2014 to 2018 from the Sentinel-1 satellite. And line of sight means the relative change in distance between the satellite and the location on the ground. So positive values here um, in orange and red colors mean that the pixel on the ground has come closer to the satellite and negative um, here blue means that the location has moved further away. So this picture can well correspond to subsidence and westward movement of this part of the, of the island that actually later on collapsed. Um, but people um, have interpreted this signal as a period of deflation of the volcano, which kind of does make sense if you draw, um, if you make a circular pattern out of it, because of course you don't know what's going on here in the below the water. And yeah, of course now we know that this signal was most likely related to um, the, the sliding of the, of the westward sector of the volcano. And also, so I'm, if we look at the, the time series of this single pixel here, we can see that it was kind of continuously um, displaced over this four year sequence. And interestingly, we don't really see any um, acceleration whatsoever prior to um, its collapse in December 2018. So one reason could be, not necessarily, but it could be that um, the acceleration maybe took place offshore, so that it was kind of initiating from below the sea where the satellites are blind. So I think there are two really good reasons that um, it's really um, necessary to include the offshore part of the volcano to assess the hazards. And for the next part, I would like to look at how uh, marine research can help assess um, these volcanic hazards. And I would like to take you to South Italy, to um, Etna volcano. And this is, the, this is a view from sea. Um, and we look directly towards um, the so-called Valle del Bove scar. So you can also see it on this um, gradient map on the right hand. It is this scar, and this corresponds to a flank collapse that occurred um, about 8,000 years ago. So it is also this flank that is um, slowly sliding seawards at a rate of around two to three centimeters per year. And another um, thing that I need to mention is that um, the, the unstable sector is bounded by fault systems um, to the north and to the south. So um, yeah, of course, I was interested in how does this continue offshore. So I led and co-led a number of research cruises where we collected marine geophysical data to assess the extent of Etna's offshore flank and its dynamics. So we came up with, based on all this data, we came up with an onshore offshore tectonic map. But uh, for the rest of this talk, I would like to focus on this southern um, 
sector here. So the, the southern boundary uh, between the unstable and the stable sectors. I just like to show you um, one seismic line across it that we and we interpret this profile as indication for a strike slip deformation. And I would like to show you now a 3D view um, from AUV data of this part shown here, this orange box. So um, this data was collected uh, with an AUV about uh, 50 meters above the seabed. It's a uh, two meter grid spacing and we are looking um, from, the south, from the southeast kind of upwards the flank. And we see that the fault shows up um, as a really narrow, sharp feature at the seafloor depicted by the arrows here. And if to some of you this may look familiar, then maybe this is because of its similarity with the Elkhorn scarp segment of the San Andreas fault. So in our interpretation, this is clearly um, the lateral boundary of the downwards sliding flank. And it is also an ideal site for um, our GOC geodetic array that we have at Geoma. So it's a seafloor geodetic network that is capable of detecting relative seafloor, seafloor deformation. And um, the GOC array uses the um, direct path acoustic ranging technique. So that means uh, the distance between two um, transponders at the seafloor is measured via the time of flight and the speed of sound and water. And if the distance changes, then the seafloor must have moved. And if we have a whole array of instruments across the fold, um, then we can get a really good idea about um, how the seafloor has moved. So um, the, the, the pros of this method is that we get continuous measurements, but uh, we do not get absolute positions. So we also have um, a, what we called a, a, the dunker. So that's an acoustic modem with which we can um, communicate with the stations at the seafloor, um, download the data without having to um, release them to the seafloor. So um, the seafloor genetic network at Aetna consisted of uh, five transponders and they all had line of sight um, with each other that makes 10 baselines and they continuously recorded uh, data for almost two years at an interrogation interval of 75 minutes. So I'd like to show you um, as an example, two baselines. So if we start with um, a fault crossing baseline indicated by this red line here, the distance between the transponders is around 804 meters. And we can see, um, so there's a little bit of scatter here that can be attributed mostly to the, um, to the ocean. And we see that um, the, the baseline is relatively stable until May, 2017, where there is a four centimeters um, shortening in the distance. And as a comparison, I'd like to show you um, the, the distance between um, two transponders on the same side of the, of the fold. The distance is around 144, and we can see that it is, it's really stable. So this here in the beginning of the acquisition, that was an artifact. But in May, there was hardly any, there was no uh, displacement measured. We also had um, pressure baselines, and um, we see that um, the transponders on, on this side uh, subsided by about one centimeters in that period. So um, just to show you um, the whole, all the, all the relative changes for all the baselines. Um, and when looking at this, it comes uh, very clear that, th that um, it is, there's a consistent movement across the entire network and that um, corresponds to dextral strike slip motion um, for the May 2017 event that was overall about four centimeters um, in eight days, and that classifies as a slow slip event. And this was actually um, the first measurement of strike slip motion of an offshore strike slip event. So um, this had some implications for how we interpret um, the instability at Etna. So with uh, offshore monitoring, we could show that a much larger area is affected by 
um, flank slip than previously thought. And um, we can also infer, infer a little bit about the driving processes. And we believe that um, because, uh, because slip is focused um, on one to one fold in the offshore domain, and it's kind of splitting up into several fault systems, um, we believe that the driver is actually um, seawards and it's not um, the magma chamber, but it's, or it's not mainly the magma chamber. So because um, offshore monitoring is, is so important, there's currently a big international effort to continue and expand offshore monitoring at Aetna. So um, we, in, in August last year, we deployed um, a new network in, that, in almost the same location that consists of six transponders this time and six OBS to um, kind of continue and um, extend the observation period. And our colleagues at GFZ, they are using um, the existing or an existing fiber optic cable that connects um, an, a cable observatory, uh, observatory in 2000 meters water depth here. And they um, use this in a campaign style for um, distributed acoustic sensing, um, seismic monitoring. And also since October last year, um, there is um, an effort led by uh, Mark andre Gutscher as part of his FOCUS project. Um, and the FOCUS here is a little bit further to the southeast. And um, what so they are focusing on this uh, North Alfeo fault. And um, they have deployed a um, fiber optic strain cable across this fault. So first of all, um, this is the microbathymetry collected by the ROV here of a three kilometer long section of the this fault trace. Again, it's also a really sharp fault trace. And um, they laid out the cable to have um, four crossing crossings of the fault. The cable had to be buried in sediments. That was done with um, the help of a specially designed plow. And finally, this new cable had to be um, connected to the existing cable via um, a wide junction box and it's showing this where the ROV um, is connecting uh, the junction box. So finally to calibrate the cable they, um, the group uh, of Mark Andre also deployed um, eight uh, or a seafloor geodetic network consisting of eight transponders um, also with crossing the fault here and they used a different system. Um, they used a, the, um, the Canopus system by um, XPLU. So um, yeah, I think I, I convinced you that volcano flank instability is a shoreline crossing process and um, that misinterpretation of geophysical data um, can occur when we ignore the offshore and um, to have the full benefit from offshore data, there's a long way to go, I think. And some of the challenges that we need to overcome is um, how to um, extrapolate the point, point measurements that we currently have to a wider area. Um, then there's a question of real-time data transmission or near real-time data transmission, how we can do that if it's not cable, if the systems are not, are not cabled. And um, of course, how this could be linked to um, tsunami early warning systems. And uh, finally, I would like to make a little announcement that I have a, <laughs> a four-year postdoc position um, in my ERC starting grant to give out. So if you're interested, feel free to contact me or um, yeah, apply. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks Morelia for this uh, great talk. Um, does uh, anyone have any question for Morelia? 
All right, so I'm I'm going to ask the first the first one then. Um, so at the beginning of your presentation, you showed us a seismic um, images of the the area where you deployed uh, the network of transponders, and uh, so I noticed that it's not a pure strike slip fault. You have like several branches. Um, so where did you uh, put the transponder? Like across the entire region, or um, did you focus on one fault in particular? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think you're referring to this to this image. Yeah. So I, we were we were measuring um, basically. I don't know. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Yeah. So we were measuring from here to here, more or less, or here probably. So across this, um, and I think it, it, so this is the seismic image, but I think it comes a little bit clearer when looking at the AUV image that it really, this really is the main. Yeah, this really is where the action is taking place or most of the action. And of course we have, we've measured only across this. So there may as well be more branches that we have not covered, which would lead to even further, uh, to even more slip. But that would, be, that would even, I think the interpretation that we've done, um, yeah, that would even strengthen the, the interpretation that we have done. But I think from the morphology, I believe that this is, this is where the action has taken place and that we've probably pretty well covered most of the slip. And so this is like an area without any sediments, right? It's like not easy to map strikes the poles. Yeah, it's, there's hardly any sediment because it's very steep. So yeah, it was actually really hard to find um, line of sight positions and um, also positions that are not so steep where, the, um, where our instruments can actually stand. Um, yeah, it was quite challenging and yes, very, very little sediment cover. Thank you. Any questions? So maybe I, I'm gonna ask another one. Um, just being curious, like, so if this tank was like to fail in a very catastrophic uh, way, so this would lead to a giant like landslide and associated tsunami. So did you did you run any simulation like how big would that tsunami be? I think it's that that would be a bit too early because um, yeah I think people have done it so they've they've simulated the whole thing collapsing so the whole eastern flank. But um, I think that's very unlikely. I think it's more likely that single parts break off so to say, but it's very, I think it's, yeah, at the moment we don't see any indication for any um, acceleration or something. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to do it, <laughs> I think. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Jackie, do you have a question? Um, I do, thank you. Um, I think that was a super exciting presentation and, and nice to see this work being done. And I'm curious, I think I might have missed it, but when you talked about the fact that you think that this would fail by retrogressive failure and not be driven by the magma chamber, it has always struck me that there is some question about chicken and egg there. And I'm, I think I just might have missed how I fully recognize that the flank slips sort of without necessarily pressure from the magma, but I wonder how we know sort of cause and effect. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a very good question. Thanks for that. I didn't have, um, I think I didn't, spend too much time on that, but let me just, yeah, maybe come back to this, to this map. So um, the, I think the, um, well, there's, there's, I think I'm, I'm not saying that it's purely driven by, by gravity or tectonics, for example, but there is, there is, there is, an influence of the of the magma system. So because um, these 
um, these slow slip events on land, they mostly they mostly linked to um, to dike intrusions. But I think this is this is like an additional push. But I think the main the main driver is somewhere um, in the offshore, and um, the reason why we interpret this is is that um, yeah that that we first of all um, seeing a lot of or quite a strong deformation quite far away from the actual summit or where the the magma is yeah it's doing its work <laughs> i think this is this is already one thing that was kind of unexpected that we would see so much deformation here out here and um, the second uh, reason would be that we believe i mean we cannot say ex exclusively because this is the only place where we actually measured where we have this point measurement but um it appears also from the morphology um, that that this really is like that um, the the slip is really accommodated by this one single fault here, and this is different on land. So in the same and we were um, I think I yeah I didn't show this. So we were comparing the observation period of our offshore me measurements to um, INSAR and GPS data on land. And we could see while we had about four centimeters here, um, we had two centimeters of slip here and two centimeters of slip here. So this is kind of, um, I mean, two plus two makes four. So <laughs> we kind of believe that that this, this movement is kind of split up into several fault branches. So the strain is partitioned, and the strain is partitioned away from from its driver, basically. So you would you would dis, you would suspect the driver, like yeah, near the near this, and then partitioning away from the driver. So we have another question in the chat. So from Mark Zimberge, can you? Can you provide a link on the optical fiber cable measurement? Um, um, I, I think there, yeah, it depends on, on what you mean. So the, the, the DIS measurements on the existing cable or the new ones? Mark, do you want to jump in and uh, ask your question? <laughs> Yes, I'm just wondering about uh, what the status of the new cable is and, and what method is going to be used to interrogate its length. Yeah, so the new, the new cable, so the six kilometer cable, that's um, using BOTDR for strain measurements. And um, so this was, this was put in place in October last year. And I think they, um, they connected it all and it's supplied um, with energy. But I'm not entirely sure if if they have collected already data with that. I'm not sure about that. Okay, thank you. But there will be there will be a new cruise in January next year. So then that will definitely thank you. give an update. So any other question? We started a little uh, earlier, so maybe we can uh, also move to the discussion. And you, if you have like any additional questions to Morelia, you can like uh, type them in the chat. All right. So um, as I um, mentioned earlier, so one uh, important topic that I would like to cover during this discussion is uh, rapid uh, responses to volcanic eruptions. And I would like to ask uh, Jackie kaplan Auerbach from Western Washington University to just give us a perspective on uh, rapid responses. So in a few years ago, uh, she got an NSF rapid proposal funded to deploy the, some OBS during the Kilauea eruption 
So Jackie, can you uh, just tell us why do you think rapid responses are very important in terms of science, but also for other reasons? I think you, you, you brought a lot of undergraduate students at sea with you. Uh, but also, what are the challenges that are associate, uh, associated with these uh, rapid responses? Yeah, I'd be yeah. happy to chat about that. I sent in the slide. I don't know if it really matters. It's, um, um, I'm going to share it. Yeah, sorry. My computer has crashed, so I have no... I can't access my own stuff, but thank you for this. Um, and, and really quick, Anne, how, many, how much time do I have? A couple minutes. Is that... Yeah. 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 Okay. So... This is actually so nicely sort of um, the groundwork for this was so nicely laid by the last talk. So I want to say <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so yeah, as you heard in the previous talk, if you didn't kind of know this part of the story that during the unrest at Kilauea and the, the very unusual eruption in the Lower East Rift Zone in um, 2018, there was also a magnitude uh, 6.9 earthquake that took place. You can sort of see in the figure there the um, the uh, moment tensor showing where that took place that moved the south, the submarine south flank. And, you know, so much of the activity at Kilauea occurs in that very um, sort of coastal zone, that lower east drift zone. So in response, we requested funding and received funding from the National Science Foundation to put in this network of ocean bottom seismometers. And, and they're shown in the stars that are in this figure. Um, I apologize, that's quite small. But we put out 12 short period OBSs. We left them out there for about three months and captured sort of the, the closing phases of the eruption. I would say probably about half the time we were out there, there the eruption was still ongoing. So that included um, the portion where there was lava pouring in at the, uh, in the lower Puna area and there was summit collapse events going on in the form of these sort of magnitude five earthquake dropping events as the caldera form. Um, so we recorded as well, we're still, you know, looking at these data as we speak, but um, we published a paper in SRL the other day, the other day, last year, talking about uh, the preliminary results and at least telling people these data exist we were able with this network to detect about a thousand earthquakes in the offshore south flank region that were not located by the HVO network. And it's sort of an open question how much of that was because HVO was focused very importantly on the rift zone and the caldera, but there clearly was activity offshore and our hope was to kind of capture some of the activity associated with that flank slip to try to understand more about how that process occurs and progresses. Um, we also captured a lot of acoustic and seismic signals associated with the growth of the island. Um, turns out about 60 or more percent of all the lava that erupted was emplaced offshore. And we know that in some places that forms a very unstable structure um, because of the fragmental material upon which the, the flows are built. So we captured a lot of signals that sort of track the progress of the growth of the island. So those are sort of the directions that we're taking the study and in part again to understand that flank stability. With respect to what Anne mentioned, um, the, you know, we feel like getting out there in a rapid manner was very important to try to understand that flank behavior and to understand the island growth. But clearly there is a real challenge in mobilizing this stuff very quickly. Um, we had the misfortune of doing this right during the transition from OBSIP, which was the IRIS version of the Ocean Bottom Seismometer Instrument Pool, to the OBSIC, which is the version that is currently run by Woods Hole. And in that transition, it was a little challenging to figure out how can we get instruments and how can we make, um, how can we get out there in a rapid sense. So we sort of had to do the legwork of finding instruments that were available and finding a ship. We couldn't go through the UNAL system because those ships are scheduled well in advance. We were very fortunate in that the University of Hawaii had a ship that was basically about to be mothballed and was available. Um, and we grabbed a whole lot of students. We grabbed the mm -hmm. instruments that we could and we headed out. And for the most part, we feel like it has been very successful. And again, still in the process of looking at those data. Um, but having the ability to mobilize instrumentation in a rapid manner, I think, is very important for events like this. Um, and I think with the 
improvements in seafloor geodesy, we may have more opportunities to see that events are, are ongoing or coming and that we are gonna want to have that capacity. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know we don't have much time, so I'll cut it off there. Any questions for Jackie? So you said that you brought like 12 OBS. What was your dream number? Like you <laughs> We were pretty content just to have that. So I, I, I don't think, um, I think if we could have put out a handful more, probably, you know, I think 18 would have been a little better to cover some of the areas we had hoped to cover. Further, one instrument failed to return to the surface and another one failed to, to record. So largely, I think in these scenarios, having redundancy is very important. Um, and we really didn't have any redundancy. Um, so we also were very fortunate in that there was a cruise that was actually scheduled for the area, um, another OBS cruise. And um, Donna Shillington, who was a PI on that project, was willing to delay her cruise by a, uh, a month so that we were able to use some of those instrumentations. So the collaborative um, approach that, that she and her crew took um, really allowed our science to progress. And I really wanna you know, make sure that that is recognized because uh, you know, there aren't enough instruments to go around. And I think the, um, having people being willing to ensure that other science happens is really an extraordinary thing. Thanks, thanks Jackie. So I think on, on the same topic, um, so as Jackie said, there are obviously some challenges associated with this rapid response, including the number of uh, um, OBS in the national pool. And, but the good news is that there, are, there have been some recent discussion about where to overcome these challenges. And there was, for instance, a rapid response uh, OBS um, SIG uh, organized last year. And the, uh, the outcome of this uh, SIG um, are described in a white paper. So I'm gonna put it in the chat if you're interested. Uh, but now I would, I would like to ask uh, John Collins from uh, UPSIG at Woods Hall to give us a very brief update on the current effort that are being made by UPSIG and USGS to increase, increase the pool of short period OBS uh, to expand the, the fleet. John? Okay. Um, yes, clearly OPSIC is not really helping when it comes to rapid response. Um, um, I was just thinking earlier this morning, we had requests to respond to the 7.7 .7 Cuba earthquake in January, the Alaska earthquake in July, and most recently the New Caledonia sequence of earthquakes, especially the big one in February, and we were not able to help, right? Obviously we do want to help, the problems are OBS availability, battery availability, and personnel availability, right? Um, and I think clearly the solution is to have a dedicated set of OBSs um, that are dedicated to rapid response, that are sitting on a pallet I, either here on the East Coast or on the West Coast, um, ready to go. And um, we, we have been working, OPSIC has been working very closely with Nathan Miller at USGS Woods Hole to um, develop a protocol for how we might build a fleet of OBS dedicated to rapid response and how we might utilize them in terms of personnel in particular. You know, you, a mix of USGS personnel and a mix of OPSIC personnel. In terms of instrumentation, there is a proposal in the works right now to um, for a new OPSIC fleet consisting of 100 broadband OBSs and 100 short period OBSs. And those short period OBSs are, what we are proposing is they will be node-like, i.e. small, and they will carry, they will have a three month on bottom capability and they will carry a four and a half hertz geophone and a hydrophone and potentially a MEMS accelerometer for um, capturing on scale some larger events. Um, so, but at the moment in that proposal, those hundred, none of those 100 short period OBSs 
are dedicated to rapid response, right? They are there for active source work only at this point in time. So um, that's a question for the audience here is um, number one is, um, is that type of an instrument adequate for rapid response? My guess is that it is, right? And how many should we build for a rapid response capability? So what would be the best way uh, to, for the community to provide like feedback to you or USGS or? I, I think it's NSF, I think, needs to hear, wants to hear um, that um, this set of instrumentation should be built. It's community demand, I think, is the important thing. So we, as a community, we have to communicate, communicate to NSF. I th yes. Any comments, question for John? Okay, so let's let's move on. And I I thought it, it would be nice to have like a a perspective for someone outside of the U.S. So now I would like to uh, ask Wayne Crawford from uh, l'Institut Physique Développement de Paris (IPGP) uh, to tell us about his recent rapid response experience off of Mayotte Island, which is located in the Indian. Ocean off of the coast of Southeast Africa, where an undersea volcano is forming. So, Wayne, could you tell us about um, how did it go for you, this rapid response? Hi, Anne. Thanks a lot. Um, Do you want I, sh I share your slide? Yeah, slide, please. Okay. So, first off, it's uh, rapid is in quotes on the slide because. Uh, the crisis started in May of 2018, and we deployed in February of 2019, which is 10 months afterwards. Uh, in a, one sense, we got very lucky because the activity was still going on. Um, in another sense, it wasn't so lucky because we missed the entire volcano building process, because if we had deployed right away, we would have been there while the volcano was being built. And um, there are a lot of... Um, explosive events that have, or their explosive events have been recorded from, um, uh, we think uh, lava flows as the volcano is uh, having um, uh, lava erupted. And if we had been able to record that, I, I have this dream that we would have actually seen the structure growing as the lava flows kind of changed position with time. Uh, in order to record those, it turned out our OBS is that we deployed the first time, which we're recording at 62 and a half samples per second, couldn't record that because they were too high frequency. We needed some things. It was on OBSs that were 250 samples a second. So that's sort of a first lesson also is to make sure that your instruments are broad enough band to be able to capture a lot of different signals. There's a second kind of signal that we see on these instruments, which is a low frequency um, sort of, uh, well, this is known for this, uh, this event was this low frequency uh, VLF uh, event at about 15 seconds that was heard around the world at one time. Uh, it turns out that these are all the time there, and we think it's a magma chamber resonating, and that's not heard on instruments that only stay at the short periods. And so, fortunately, on some of our OBSs, we had um, uh, well, hydrophones that go out to 20 seconds. It's not expensive and it's not power consuming, but it's a good idea to have something that goes to lower frequencies too. So, idea to have a broad band range. So, band range. So, the crisis started in May of 2018, and if you look at the um, the image there at the top, you can see that most of the seismicity, most of the events occurred in the first month. It was, it's an area that has no seismicity or about one or two felt earthquakes every decade in general. And what you're seeing on the plot there on the right are magnitude 3.5 pluses, which are almost all felt earthquakes. So we had hundreds of felt earthquakes in the first month. Uh, it was kind of a, you know, very, very worrisome for the people on land who had no idea where these things were coming from. But by the time we kind of got to reacting, the seismicity started going down. Uh, so that was around in June. Um, but at the same time, the island started moving east and downward and some fishermen started report reporting burnt fish. And so there was some indication that there was some, you know, there was a, a volcanic event which could be corresponding to a magma chamber emptying, but um, we didn't, we don't have rapid response OBSs. And that was a big problem because one, 
um, well, we couldn't airship our OBSs, so we had to send them by sea. So one once we got them shipped, uh, it took them two months to get on site. And second off, we just didn't have a really efficient method to send something right over there right away. So that was, you know, we could have done a lot better. But um, what did happen was we, we did get there in February of 2019. We deployed six short period OBSs, but with intermediate period hydrophones on them, um, along with pressure gauges, which we'd borrowed from another group uh, to see if we could get some seafloor deformation. Uh, we deployed from a local barge and uh, three stations were added to the land network. And so this picture in the sort of the, the right middle right shows the OBS uh, network location. And if you look at it, um, we had all kinds of ideas of where the seismicity could be. The red and the green events are from kind of global networks and the black events were from the local network, but which only had a couple of stations. And so we had a lot of doubt about where the seismicity would be uh, because the local network was so limited that we couldn't really tell. And if you look kind of at the arc shape of that, that's actually sort of a network effect rather than actually a distribution of seismicity. And if you look down below at the, uh, the plot below, all of the earthquakes located by this network clustered down to where you see sort of the purple spot. So there's this ring of events that actually has kind of a ring fault thing, but starts very, very deep, 20 kilometers deep and going to 40 kilometers deep. Um, that's right near to the island. There's a second swarm that's called Swarm 2 here that's further to the east. And then when we came back in May and recovered our OBSs with a real oceanographic ship that could do bathymetry, we found the new volcanic edifice, which is an 800 meter tall edifice, about the biggest basalt eruption that's been recorded in the past century. And it's not where the seismicity is. So it's, it's a real uh, sort of an unpacking uh, question of where, you know, where things come from and where they were. Uh, there's a paper submitted by uh, Natalie Feuillet and, and, and all of us, um, which has been sitting in uh, review uh, for the past year and a half. That's kind of a scandal of its own, but um, I won't get into that. Uh, but what we see is off to kind of the, the west side, we see this ring fault of seismicity, um, which we think is where the, the source of magma is coming from. And then we see the second swarm might be part of the magma pathway to the eruption site uh, itself. Uh, so um, what else do I have to say about that? So we're still actually, we, we recovered the instruments, but we, we're still redeploying them. We've had sometimes uh, networks of up to 20 instruments, but we have sort of six stable instruments that are always being deployed. So it's been about uh, since February, 2019. So two years now, we go out about four times a year to recover, uh, evaluate because there's a, there's a strong, um, sort of risk and surveillance, uh, surveillance uh, worry about this uh, seismicity here. Um, and so we have to kind of update continuously the, uh, the, 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 uh, the information. Um, the, the things we noticed were, yeah, we need to have a high sample rate. We need to have a uh, broad frequency. And as a response in other things, we were actually putting in an infrastructure package, but this, the fact that we couldn't respond rapidly did help us to get some support for rapid response OBSs in this overall infrastructure package, which will have um, about uh, 10, 20 rapid, rapid response instruments, uh, five rapid response pressure gauges, and also a real-time capable array around the uh, principal nearshore swarm. So I've got lots of other things to say, but I've also probably gone over my time, so I'm going to leave it to you now. Thanks, Wayne. So if you have any question for Wayne, just type it in the chat. And I know it's a little late, but I would like to uh, ask one last person to talk about um, permanent observatory. And these are very important for an, uh, anticipating volcanic uh, eruption. So I would like to ask uh, Enat Lev from La Mondeurti Earth Observatory if she could like give us uh, our perspective on this. So Enat, very quick, maybe two, three minutes max. Yeah, sure, yeah. I'll be really fast. Do you want to put my slide on? Or Are should you? I? Oh, you can you can go for it if you. Okay. If you have it. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Okay, great. 
Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. I don't usually work uh, in a submarine environment, so it's really nice to see you all. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to a project that um, it's called AVERT. Uh, the acronym stands for Anticipating Volcanic Eruptions in Real Time. And it's a new project that's funded by the Mu Foundation, and where we would deploy a multi-parameter array um, it includes a whole bunch of things, seismic, GPS, cameras, gas sensors, MT, infrasound, um, on two islands in the Aleutian Arc, um, Cleveland and, and Okmok, um, that have kind of different styles of eruption and um, pre-eruption uh, precursors. And we wanted to have the data open and um, satellite communication going to telemeter the whole thing in real time to kind of demonstrate how to really anticipate eruptions we need all of these things um, coming in and streaming in and um, Anne asked me a few questions that I'm trying to address here. Um, were there any discussions while deploying AVERT or the developing AVERT on having a marine component? And my answer is definitely yes. Um, we really wanted because of everything that was being said about how volcanic eruptions, uh, volcanoes are uh, crossing the shoreline and we need to see all parts of it. Um, we wanted to have an amphibious network and the price was just really high. So we, the way we're going about it is in collaboration with GeoMar to do a submarine geodetic and a submarine um, seismic. Um, there were not too many technical challenges. I mean, it would, we acknowledge that it would be really hard to do submarine real-time data streaming in, but it'll be nice to do <laughs> if we could. Um, but that was, we also wanted to just see um, the other side or the, the whole volcano if possible. Um, that's a question about the community, whether it's uh, the onshore and offshore volcano community is connected. And I'd say it's kind of so-so and it's um, it could be better. Um, there's always more ways to collaborate. And I just put in a note about the, um, the rapid response discussion in the chat that the onshore community, uh, the volcano community is now in the process of building community um, standards for rapid response and working with NSF on a research collaboration network in RCN, it's called Converse. And it would be really, really good to have the submarine community connected to that effort as well, so that we have those stand out, like the standing in um, instruments and protocols and data sharing rules and all that. Um, I do I think it's less critical to have a man, um, marine component? No, <laughs> come on, man. I mean, it's basically like anticipating a hippo jumping at you by looking just at its top of the head, right? Because like it's a big system and the magma to really go down um, to where the magma is coming from, maybe not just the shallowest couple of kilometers um, uplift, uh, you need to see the whole system, both with geodesy and with seismicity um, and also thermal if we could, because there's indications that there's long-term um, heating of big volcanic systems that you can see from space, but that you can't see that on the on the bottom of the ocean. So I hope I'm answering um, all of uh, the questions that Anne asked, and I definitely want to see more collaboration um, across the shoreline on looking at volcanoes, both forecasting and responding to eruptions. Thanks so much, Enad, for yeah. sharing your perspective, and thanks for all the- Thanks for inviting me speakers uh, for the discussion and for the keynote lecture and I think now it's time to go to the second topic. Jinhua, are you ready? I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm ready. Uh, let me start sharing my screen first. Okay. Uh, thanks, Anne. So, hello, everyone. This is Jianhua Gong. Uh, I will be the moderator for the second part of this session on tsunami hazards. So, first, let me briefly introduce the schedule for the following one hour. Uh, there are two talks in this part, uh, one keynote talk by Krista, one Hillebrand Andrade, and a shorter talk by Anne Xie. Uh, after each talk, there will be a Q&A session. You could type your questions into the chat, both during and after the presentation, or raise your hand using the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call you to ask your questions.
So following the two presentations, there will be a 15 uh, minute open discussion on tsunami hazards. And we welcome every one of you from your audience to share your thoughts on this topic with the community. Uh, after that, we will have a 20 minute break until 2.05. So without uh, further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, uh, Krista Van Hillebrand Andrade, manager of the US National Weather Service Caribbean Tsunami Warning Program and former director of the Puerto Rico Seismic Network. And she will share with us her experience and her thoughts on tsunami warning and mitigation. So uh, first, let me share. Oh. Um. So, Krista, uh, uh, please take it away. Hi, thank you much, Genwa, and, and, and thank you for this invitation to share with you my thoughts on, on our global tsunami warning and mitigation system. And uh, I particularly enjoyed the last series of talks in my previous life to doing earthquakes and, and tsunamis. I was a volcanologist. I worked for six years in Ecuador studying the the volcanoes there high up in the Andes, but also had the opportunity to do some studies in Galapagos Island. So it was good to be back together with the volcano community, also with whom over this, you know, who are also part of our, our tsunami challenge. So um, yes, the next slide, Genoa. So um, before going global, I'd like to go local. So as many of you know, um, last year um, on January 7th after a little bit over a week of, of very active um, seismicity, we had a magnitude 6.4 earthquake that occurred just offshore um, the island on the southern shore of the island. And um, the devastation was um, more than most people would ever have imagined. Some of us did, you know, foresee much of what happened happen. But um, for most of the people, the grand majority of the people, it was a big shock to see and affect schools collapsing, things that we had talked about um, due to short column effects that we have in, in school construction here. Um, homes, especially those that are built on these um, thin concrete columns um, to take a take advantage of the underground to put in your cars um, are historical buildings. So while we realize that this could happen, it's nothing like seeing it unfold before one's eyes and also extremely, extremely strong ground shaking. Um, so it was, uh, uh, it was been a hundred years since Puerto Rico had experienced such an earthquake. And while we had dedicated years, you know, between Puerto Rico Seismic Network, scientists, you know, from here, from United States, some engineers, emergency management talking about this, I mean, it was a, a terrible, um, a terrible, a very difficult situation, which which is ongoing, and which, together with the pandemic, has kept people, many kids, out of school for over a year. So there's been kids in Puerto Rico that have had no education um, for over a year in Puerto Rico, given the combination. And in fact, um, the government of Puerto Rico has just announced that all schools that have short columns, which is this um, structural defect, um, will not be reopening, even though they were not even they were not impacted by this earthquake, but given given in their known vulnerability and the possibility of forecasting such an event, um, they've decided just to not uh, reopen those schools until that 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 structural um, um, hazard is is addressed. So it's um, quite quite a difficult situation here. So next slide, Jinwa. So this earthquake occurred. Um, Right offshore, this is you know exactly what we're talking about. You know, is is this on you know coastal offshore interface, and while the southern southwestern Puerto Rico had experienced seismicity over many years, and 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 we were aware of of at least you know one or two um, faults, um, active faults within southwestern Puerto Rico, we were very pretty clear, pretty much blindsided on 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 the earthquake and the faults offshore. Um, so, um, and here you can see um, over, they've located over, Puerto Rico Seismic Network is over, 
locate over 15,000 earthquakes, but there's like 30,000 triggers. So we'll already locate, you know, there's still a lot more earthquake location to do, but you can see it's not just one earth, one fault structure. There are several fault structures that have been active and people like Corey Ten Brink from Woods Hole has, you know, been down here and helping us trying to, to figure all these out. But, you know, for the people living on shore, you know, just as important, and we realize, you know, the, the, the hazard that can be presented, you know, both by these onshore and offshore earthquakes. Next one. So, um, so this is this is a challenge that we have, and 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 so this is the seismic hazard we mapped, the most recent one we had as of 2003. And while it did take into account historical gridded seismicity, that's all that was taken into account for offshore Puerto Rico, and you know what we knew about GPS motions. It definitely it was only the faults that were that one fault that was located in southern Puerto Rico which really dominated our seismic hazard map. So basically, you know, the, the whole construct of, of, of earthquake hazard and, and our, the, the, the accelerations expected was very dominant on this one fault that had been mapped and, and identified and characterized in a way that could be integrated into the seismic hazard assessment. But offshore, um, that had not been done. As you could see, that offshore seismicity, we did have a lot of faults, you know, faults. And after this 2003, there was another map, another fault that had been identified a little bit further west, which if it, that had been taken consideration, these offshore faults would have definitely shown higher accelerations than what was, um, what was um, thought to be possible from the Puerto Rico seismic hazard map. Um, from 2003. Next, probably asking what does this um, have to do with tsunamis, but you have to, um, it's it's all part of this, this the, it's all one, you know, for, for the people, you know, it's all together, you know, the earthquakes and the and the tsunamis, it's 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 all part of the the same, can be all part of the, the same event. So, and, and I think, you know, one of the gaps we've had is, you know, you know, trying to bridge the gap, those who do seismic hazard analysis and those who do tsunami hazardous analysis. Here I'd just like to show you, this is, um, this is um, part of this is um, from um, JPL, um, NASA, and they did a flyover and they were able to um, document after the earthquake that it, indeed there had been subsidence. Um, as I said, the mine shock had been just right offshore Puerto Rico, but there had been several inches of subsidence on land. And you talk about, you know, what's, and this community, the map, you know, would show like three, three to four inches. You think, well, what are three to four inches? Well, three to four inches meant your patio was underwater, not underwater. I mean, we live so close to the sea, and some people are so close to sea level that this happens. Now, this earthquake occurred um, in the early morning hours, so it was totally dark. Um, so when the people felt the earthquake, because it was so strong, and we've been educating, if you feel a strong earthquake, run for higher ground. You know, don't ask questions, just don't think about it. Um, the 200 people that lived in this community, they all evacuated quickly. Um, but when they came back, they saw this whole area was underwater and they, they were sure that it had been a tsunami that had indeed occurred, even though, you know, there there was no, um, it, been, it confirmed that, you know, only, it was, you know, there, there was no tsunami hazard at, at you know, risk at the, when from that earthquake. Um, but still, you know, they were like, well, something must have happened, you know, tsunami. And so they all thought it was a tsunami for quite a while until you know we were able to confirm that this was um, indeed um, co-seismic um, displacement. And the next slide you can see um, the effect of what you know people saw. So this is an image from this area of El Faro in Guayanilla before the earthquake. Um, you can see this huge um, area, dry area to the back, which was intermittently flooded when there was heavy rains, but definitely it did not have a permanent lagoon ever in the people's memories, which is what it has right now. Um, in the past, you know, people did four tracks, they played baseball, you know, they did all sorts of um, earth activities. Well, now they have to sort of change their type of activities to kayaking. And this is just with this minimal substance. But once again, when people came back, you can imagine they felt this terrible earthquake, they evacuated to the tsunami assembly points, and four hours later, they come back and see this, you know, they were convinced it had been a tsunami. So um, observations are, are key in analyzing these type of events. So in the next slide, um, there's uh, highlighting that, yes, we were able to say, yes, there was a tsunami, but the tsunami was just, you know, very, um, a few inches to the, to, to the maximum, nothing that could be observed and nothing that would be causing this um, permanent type of flooding. So we have um, three tie gauges um, basically located, um, detected the, the tsunami around same time, like 15 minutes after um, the earthquake, because it moves, you know, along, along the shelf pretty fast. 
and so it comes up in Canyon. So we had, um, we did um, detect the, uh, the, there was a small tsunami, um, but it was not enough to, to, to um, didn't, that was, you know, had, it was just minimal, um, no impact at all. And it's just, will go down as, you know, a small tsunami from that earthquake. And it will help us characterize a little bit more um, the earthquake mechanism. Uh, but, but this type of, you know, but to the people in the next slide, you know, when they feel, um, so yeah, so and that year we had another um, earthquake um, and it was alluded to, I think it was, uh, somebody mentioned about the, the Cayman, the Cayman Cuba, Jamaica earthquake 7.8. Um, that happened um, January, so just a few weeks after that, um, and and which for which there was a tsunami threat statement was issued, um, but there was um, um, no no tsunami um, impact from that. So um, there were two events, and you know it, it just highlights you know in our region we have these earthquakes very large, and some just because of what you felt you feel you think there can become a tsunami, or they're so large that you know that our systems just sort of say, you know, there could be a tsunami just given the size of the earthquake and the location of the earthquake. So the next slide comes down to the, the bottom line for a global tsunami warning system. So as we go global, I mean, the basic, the basic um, question or fundament of anybody that works, lives, enjoys, comes to do tourism, is a uh, uh, cruise ship captain or a captain on a, a cargo vessel or, or study in these areas, you know, the question basically to them, um, beyond all the very interesting science facts and, and learning more about their environment and their offshore environment, especially, you know, and what could cause these tsunamis, they basically would like to have these questions answered. So whether you are in Indonesia, um, next slide, Joan. So whether you're in Indonesia, you're in, you're, you're in Italy, you're in, um, 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 you're in New Zealand, you're, you're in, in Puerto Rico. I mean, people live on the shore. I mean, there's there's no such thing as tsunami denial. I mean, people, when they hear the word tsunami, they, they, they realize that, you know, it's waves that, you know, these series of waves can cause huge um, impact and destruction, like exactly just a little bit over 10 years ago in Japan. So, you know, a lot of, for a lot of hazards, people say, oh, people, you know, deny or they don't recognize the hazard, you know. You know, for tsunamis, there's there's no denial. We tell them a tsunami's coming or they think that what they've perceived is a potential tsunami threat. I mean, people understand and with that comes images like this. So, so I mean, and, and that's one part of our challenge is when most people in the community, when you say, well, we're, we have a tsunami hazard um, in Chile or in Alaska, where you know, a lot of people are thinking of these, these waves like, like in Japan. But the bottom line, knowing, you know, they understand that, you know, these, these waves can cause um, wave, huge destruction. What they ask of um, tsunami officials and tsunami warning officials, next slide, Juan, please. Are, they would uh, they would oh no tsunami denial um, last week we had Kariba wave 2021 exercise in the midst of a pandemic um, most of the countries in the Kariba the Caribbean region that are which are part of our Caribbean and other um, and adjacent region tsunami warning system which involves 48 countries and territories you know they're still in the midst of the pandemic huge challenges with education emergency management vaccinations um, they still, um, we had 400,000 people register for this event. So online system, 400,000 people through agencies or directly gone online said, you know, we want to, we want to participate. We want to be prepared. You know, we want to make sure that our, 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 our systems are, are ready to go and, and, and we understand. So, um, once again, you know, there, there is this, 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 this appreciation for the hazard, um, and, what we do through these exercises, we familiarize, um, we choose different scenarios. We do these exercises every year. We'll choose two to three scenarios because um, countries want to have, each one to have something that sort of comes close to affecting them or would affect them if this event was real. So for this scenario, we had one scenario off Jamaica and another one was off Northern Lesser Antilles. And so these, you know, they start to get an idea. These are what we call energy maps in, in the tsunami world. So it shows the directivity, which is usually perpendicular to the fault motion. So we can see in Jamaica, the way the fault motion went, at, it headed Southwest. And um, for the scenario north of Northern, of North, Northern Lesser Antilles, um, it basically, most of the energy beam went into the Atlantic Ocean. So 
So people realize this, um, we test communications between the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, which is the tsunami service provider, which is the one that gives the heads up or is responsible for giving the heads up to the 48 countries and territories if there is an imminent danger from the potential danger from an earthquake, um, from an earthquake um, generated like tsunami. And then from the national authorities downstream to the coastal communities. And then at the local level, um, validating these response plans and identifying strengths and gaps. So, you know, in Puerto Rico, we realized, wow, this is an earthquake in northern Lesser Antilles. It's an 8.5. We're barely going to feel it in Puerto Rico, but 47 minutes afterwards, we're going to have an earthquake. And it takes seven minutes for PTWC to put out the message. Um, 47 minutes, we're going to have the tsunami. Takes a PTWC 40 minutes, to put, seven minutes to put out a message. That leaves us 40 minutes to do full evacuation for Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So, wow, that's that's a challenge. So these are the kind of things we learn. Um, and with these um, events that are not as continuous, like for us, hurricanes, you know, or every year events, um, somewhere in the Caribbean, um, these events would um, keep the tsunami threat on the table. So that's something we do through the exercise. Next slide, please, John. So what do people want to know if it's a real event or they're preparing for an event or there's an exercise? People always want to know if there's an imminent tsunami threat, given what they what they felt or what they heard about the earthquake. Um, they want to know how they're going to find out that there's going to be a tsunami. Um, when is it going to hit? They want to know the time. They want to know the areas that are going to be that are, that are a threat. Um, and more than just the areas, they'd like to know how big it's going to be in the areas, how much flooding is going to be, and more importantly, where they will be safe. So these are the basic goals of the Global Tsunami Warning System, which is organized within underneath uh, within UNESCO IOC, is to be able to, to respond and, and give these questions. But to answer these questions, of course, we need a lot of science and we need a lot of data. Next. So, um, so for one, you know, natural tsunami warning signs like the magnitude 6.4 earthquake in southern Puerto Rico. I mean, yeah, you felt an earthquake, houses cracked, things were falling down, you couldn't stand on your feet. You don't think twice, run for higher ground. I mean, if people, if that would have really had a, a big tsunami, an impactful tsunami, some of those communities would have been flooded within five minutes. So, I mean, there's no way you're going to get a tsunami warning out that quickly. Um, so, so, you know, we still depend a lot on the natural tsunami warning signs, but the official tsunami warning signs, um, warning um, alerts, they of course depend on, on, on data and the processing of that data and communication system, whether they go out on radio or get you on the cell phone or outdoor sirens, they all trace back um, to data and, and communications. Next. So, um, so the, you, the all tsunami warning systems, this is a, just a cartoon showing a schematic of how it works in the United States. But basically right now, all tsunami warning systems, um, you know, or, or warning centers um, basically consist of there, there, there's a center and that center is gathering the data from seismic stations and it's gathering the data from sea level stations, seismic data to detect the earthquake, the source, the, the most characteristic source of the tsunamis, and then the sea level stations that, that are used to then um, to, to determine if the tsunami in fact was generated, how big it was, and in the case of these offshore um, sensors then to be able to give a fine tune our forecast on wave heights. And then, so this data is processed and, and then the alert is, is, is sent out. So, you have to get a combination, a lot of different agencies contributing data um, to the warning center and then getting out to the public. Next slide. In the in the so in the in the in global context, there there are four tsunami warning systems. So they're, they're called regional tsunami um, services. The first one, the oldest one, is the Pacific from 1965, and then in 2005, right after the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, then the Indian Ocean um, system, the Northeast Atlantic and Mediterranean system and the Caribbean and adjacent region tsunami warning systems were developed, were stood up, and over the years they've gone through a process of development and improvement. And all these centers will have designated um, tsunami service providers at the regional level, which will then provide information at the national level, who together with their information then will decide are responsible for issuing the alert. None, no regional international tsunami center will issue any warnings for any other country um, except their own. Next. And so, so 
how so basically what it is you know how the authorities are going to find out if there's a tsunami event in you know in, in most countries you know you have your your seismic data you have your sea level data that's going into a national tsunami warning center tsunami service provider they use that data to then um, evaluate whether there's a potential tsunami threat or not next and so we have um so just on the 1st of January of this year was launched the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, and so um, the ocean science we need for the, the science we need for the ocean we want is the overall um, vision or theme of this, um, of, of the decade. And within this decade, there is a, 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 one of the major outcomes is a safe ocean. People are safe from ocean hazard threat, services are safe from the threats from the ocean. Next slide. So the tsunami community over the past two years, um, preparing for what would be this decade um, event, what we could do, we went back and we talked along the community and you know what 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 would we like to accomplish over 10 years? And and yes, well, so we, here on this graph you will see there's three colored lines. There's a yellow line, a green line, and a blue line. Next scale, you see the, the tsunami source uncertainty. So how uncertain are you at the moment you're issuing a product? Um, and then the time since origin of the event. So it goes zero and then goes out to a day. So, you know, from 2000, you know, back in the day before the 2004 tsunami, you know, it took, it took for this, this uncertainty to drop could take almost a day. So, I mean, you're already underwater and you're finally figuring out really what happened during, during the earthquake. Um, in 2019, um, we're basically able to um, detect the earthquake really fast. I mean, that's always happened. Um, we're able, but it takes us still 15 to 20 minutes to get a candle on the, on the source, but it can take up to two hours, you know, two hours and sometimes still up to a day to really get that source of that tsunami um, good. So what we would like to do, we'd like to reduce that uncertainty to zero within 10 minutes or basically close to zero. So quickly be able to, um, with the data, with, with data, be able to constrain um, uh, the, uh, the, the tsunami in such a way that we're able to forecast that impact and the timing of that impact on different communities. So that's our goal, how to get down to 10 minutes. Well, we're not going to do it with seismic because seismic, um, it's we're still always um, using seismic data to interpret what could be happening within the ocean. So we really need more ocean data, which really is going to give us the real source of that tsunami signal and give us that data. Next. So it's a combination. We need the seismic data, which gives us the first heads up, but also, you know, we need it, the only way that we can know how much of the ocean is deformed and things if we have these ocean bottom, we have these, these measurements of the sea level. So we're looking at, you know, taking on the ocean. So right now it's just coastal sea level and, 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 and these darts, which are these deep ocean assessment tools that we have. So where would lead one, the reason, one of our most exciting proposals for a decade next um, is that, uh, we would we need um, more observations from the ocean. We just have you know like 30 um, ocean deep ocean observations. So a lot of these places where these tsunamis are being generated, um, we have to wait a significant amount of time until the tsunami gets to one of these um, detection capabilities. Either you know ocean these these. NOAA DART systems or, or other DART systems from around the world or the sea level gauges. Next, Joanne. So what can we do? So there's two things that we'd like to see advance. One is through uh, on this is equipping um, ocean um, communication cable with um, sensors, with ocean, with with um, ocean pressure sensors and accelerometers. So, um, so right now we have all these cables, you know, millions of miles of cables around the world, but you know they don't tell us anything about the ocean floor or what's going on in that ocean through which they're passing. So we could really significantly augment and be able to detect these tsunamis uh, much more broadly if we had that. Um, the other thing is that we know and we realize and we recognize that GNSS is able to give us a lot more about source information that about that earthquake source and it was so successful in Japan, but still we have not been able to bring that into the operational arena in a widespread um, way. So two of our, those are two significant things that we'd like to do is equipping our, these, these ocean cables with not only um, ocean pressure sensors, but also with accelerometers that would be able to give us this um, much better, quicker information. And then um, the GNS data coming into our systems. Next. 
So, so yeah. So this is this is this is from Bruce Hound. So there's a, a group that works on um, that is, is coordinates the joint um, joint task force um, for smart, and it's. Um, sharing this cable infrastructure and in fact there's a couple of projects that are already underway and i know that there's one offshore um the west the eastern coast of italy southeastern italy i don't know if it's linked to the mount etna or could possibly come into play with that event but you know being able to put um these sensors at the repeaters of these submarine um, communication cables so this is something that we're really excited about um our community because of what it does, does for tsunamis, seismology, but also um, for other climate change and for other um, efforts. So basically you have 70, seven, repeater every 70 kilometers, so you'd have an accelerometer and ocean bottom pressure every 70 kilometers with refreshing of that equipment every 20 years. So that we understand is a first order addition to our ocean earth observing system. Next. So, um, also, you know, as I mentioned, um, GNSS, and then we have cabled observatory that's also been also been um, uh, talked about. So, and also this will take a lot more computational power and infrastructure. Next. So, um, outside, then coming back to the public um, thing is, you know, we still have to get, you know, with that data, we could give much better amplitude forecasts on what that tsunami is going to be. Because it's not the same if you're going to get a, a, a two inches of a tsunami, if you're going to get a couple of feet of tsunami or your, you know, a couple of, you know, meters, that, that makes a huge difference. So hopefully with this data, we'd be able to give better, um, more move to giving better forecast um, information and, and in a quicker fashion. So then the local authorities then can then warn, warn appropriately. Next. So, and then from there, um, with the data that we gather, you know, not only through observations, but also the, the data, the seismic data that we are gathering, that sort of helps us define much better what these um, sources are, um, for example, earthquake sources. And then we can prepare before the event happens already our evacuation maps, have signage for places and have um, signage in place and then have our communication systems ready to go. So this is, you know, this is important that this all um, comes together. And and one of the very important things that I, I should have, I forgot to mention, but I, I want to mention it now, is the fact that, you know, our, our whole tsunami warning system is really based on the premise that the tsunami is going to be the result of an earthquake and more subduction type earthquake. And we know that that's not always the case. You know, we, we Indonesia taught us that in 2018 with, with, um, um, with, with, with Palau and then, and then, and then, and Krakatau. So, so you know, volcanoes and these atypical um, earthquake sources. I mean, um, they, they cause these devastating tsunamis. I mean, obviously, earthquake information is not enough. That, that, that would have not answered that question: Is a tsunami coming? How big is the tsunami going to be? And that's why you know, just the measuring of that ocean, you know, that ocean surface. Or you know, if we had, we're able to integrate volcanic somehow some of this volcanic information or, or def ground deformation to somehow be able to address these other tsunamis is also um, very important and part of our goal within the next decade. Next. So um, so and along with the the scientific and the observing component. Um, just as important for us is the readiness of the people to respond to these earthquakes. So the other bold goal that we have for um, the next 10 years, you know, not only going from, you know, 10 minutes being certain of what tsunami and how big it's going to be and where it's going to hit and all its impact, is that every very vulnerable tsunami community is community, every very community that's very vulnerable tsunamis be tsunami ready, for which the UNESCO IOC, the community has come up um, with its partners and emergency managers, exactly what those um, um, those, those guidelines need to be. What do you have to do? Those indicators. So every community would have to have its mapped hazard, would have to know how many people could be impact, have signage, have money to deal with it, human resources to deal with, have evacuation maps, educational material and activities, exercise, response plans, emergency operations, plans and facilities, and the comms to receive and, and disseminate alerts. So that's a tsunami ready community. So our goal is 100% tsunami ready worldwide. So as we're moving along and advancing the science and the operational and the data capability, we also have to keep empowering the communities that are gonna be facing these, um, these, these devastating events. Next. So we, you know, so, 
obviously we need enhancements of the global tsunami warning system. We, we're, we're still blindsided by some events. We don't give all the information that emergency manager, people that live in com coastal communities want to know. So we understand the UN decade is that opportunity to, to advance this, to understand the hazard rethink observations, uh, look at a more integrated approach, uh, mapping of the ocean, so seabed 2030, um, and applying computational um, power, and as I said, 100% of coastal communities tsunami ready. Next. And this is our challenge, and if we are able to do that correctly, then all these people can be mas tranquilos, as we say in Puerto Rico, you know, and, you know, a little bit more um, trust that, you know, when these events, they'll, 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 they'll get the warning they need and they'll be able to understand um, better what the threat is and how they can best prepare to, to face and, and, and survive them. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Krista, for your very informative talk. And we now know better like how volcano forecast is really implemented in reality. So thank you for your talk. And uh, as I said, like if you have questions, you could uh, raise your hand or uh, I can uh, I can call you to speak about your questions or or if there's no no questions at this moment, I have some I have some more questions to ask. Uh, I think I'm quite interested in the geology of the Puerto Rico and the earthquake at the uh, earlier last year. So uh, you, I'm wondering like what is the Focal mechanism of that earthquake is it happened on the plate interface, or um, how it caused the subsidence subsidence of the coastal area, and also on one of the map you showed about Puerto Rico, it seems like there are subduction zones on both the south and north side of the island, and I'm wondering is there like earthquake or tsunami hazard for both the subduction zones, or is it more had hazards uh, on the southern side. So how many minutes do I have? Do I have another half an hour now? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. But yeah, just, just in general, Puerto Rico is at the interface of the, of the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. So it's a very broad um, area of, of, of deformation, but it's more the, 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 the limit between the two plates is to the north of the island. And then we've had generated Throughout the throughout the region, then additional faults, and so we have we have normal faulting, reverse faulting. We have you know we have those that are associated with the subduction zone. We have our thrust faults um, and our strike slip motion. So it's it's so the earthquake in southern Puerto Rico. One of the things is there was um, leading up to the earthquake. Most of the earthquake was on a, a strike slip. Earth, um, one of our strike slip faults that had been recently um, detected in previous years by one of our local um, geologists working here locally. And then, um, but the main earthquake occurred on a normal fault. It was a different fault, it was a normal fault um, with, uh, with a down, down slope from on the northern face. And that's why we had the land subsidence that, that occurred. And that's also why we had, then we had the, the tsunami was generated. So it's a very complicated zone. And, you know, it's um, a colleague of mine, you know, she she says, you know, it's like in New Zealand or, you know, Christchurch, where you have all these different faults interacting. It's not just one fault, you know, with one mechanism that's generating this. It's series and they've sort of triggered these other earth, <laughs> other faults were, were, were triggered as part of this whole sequence. So we refer to it the Puerto Rico earthquake sequence with a very complicated geometry that we're still trying to figure out. But yeah, so even though we're like 200 kilometers away from that main interface, we're still having these large, these earthquakes which cause some significant impact, especially because okay. they're so close to built up environment. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, Krista. And uh, okay, since I think there's no more questions, uh, we will move on to our next speaker. Okay. Uh, I do have a question. Oh, oh, you do have. Sorry, I. Yeah, I had my hand raised. <laughs> I, I guess there, there's. I think there's like 103 people out there, so it's probably easy to miss me. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, my my question is kind of multi-layered here. Um, I'm in Thailand, and I was talking to some of my colleagues about this uh, marine uh, symposium, marine seismology symposium, and and one of the one of my Thai colleagues mentioned that. Uh, 
in 2018, and I think he was referring to the, the Krakatoa volcano one, that the tsunami warning system didn't work for that particular event. And I'm just trying to get verification because I haven't done research on it. So do you have any knowledge on that? Yeah, so indeed, um, we they, there was no tsunami warning was issued for the Nat Krakatoa tsunami. And that is because um, the way our tsunami warning system works and, you know, at the national level, at the regional, the global level is we're on the lookout for larger earthquakes. So basically the tsunami warning system triggers in, you start evaluating an earthquake, whether it has tsunami potential or not, as of magnitude six, and really as of 6.5, there'll be some centers that will be issuing some alerts locally, but usually it's not until an earthquake of magnitude 7.1 that you know you really think you're thinking that, wow, there could be some serious you know um, tsunami threat. And and the earthquakes associated with Anak Krakatau and, and its, its volcanic activity um, and leading up to the flank collapse were magnitudes 3.5, 4.0. So you can, um, so, so, so those kites wouldn't trigger, they're not part of our system. And so we had some dialogue and said, you know, so what do we do for volcanoes? And we have the same issue here in the Caribbean. We have Kikam Jenny, it's a submarine volcano. We have um, some volcanoes like Mount Pelé, they're located very Martinique, also active, located very close to the shore. You know, so what do you, what, what can we do to address this? And so one, you know, is, is, is this dialogue between the earth, the tsunami community and the volcano monitoring community. So right now we're in the process of really coming up with a, a protocol by whereby the volcano observatory would say, look, you know, this volcano is active, it's showing this, and that type of information would be communicated to the tsunami warning system. And so they would be appraised and they would be following. So signals that normally they wouldn't think would be associated with a tsunami, they could start saying, oh, let's, let's see what we can do. Luckily also, um, Another suggestion is because volcanoes, you know, don't erupt usually from one day to the next. They give us some time to get ready. Not as much time as we sometimes like, but a lot more than the earthquakes or tsunamis give us, right? So within this, this precursor period, if we were able to install sea level sensors, and I was interested because I talked about off Italy that they were going to put ocean bottom pressure sensors um, off there. That would be very good because the only way that that a warning center could issue something because we can't do it based on a 3.5 volcano is if we actually detect the tsunami. So if we have some, some, some network of sea level sensors close to that volcano, as soon as that flank collapse happens or that volcanic activity, which generates the deformation of the sea, then those sea level stations will trigger it and we'll be able to associate it because we know, yes, there is a volcano that was going on. We have this and we will be able to, and so we're coming up with messages that we would be able to issue. So that is something that we're trying to address because, you know, you know Anak Krakatau, our system is just not designed to, to respond and issue a, a tsunami warning. Besides, you know, it's very fast time, but, you know, for the people, it's all a tsunami. Yes. May I interrupt you? I think we, yeah. I'm so sorry. I think we are going to have to move on. Okay. I'll, I'll mess, yeah, I'll, I'll message but you the other two comments. This was what I was uh, suggesting. Yeah. Thank you. So we can also leave some of the discussions in the open discussion part. Uh, so now let's move on to our second speaker. Uh, uh, so our second speaker is An Xie, Professor of Geological Sciences and Fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. And she will share up with us a novel method of using shipborne GPS to study tsunami. So take it away, Anne. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so today I'm going to share with you some work on exploring the utility of ship GPS or GNSS position uh, for tsunami forecasting. My collaborators are Jakir Hossein, uh, Ian Mulia, and David Benson. So uh, data simulation has been around for a while. It's used by weather forecasters. Um, it's a method that uses real-time observations to develop a forecast. Um, so it's using direct observations. On the left is the traditional model with a source, um, and then the little dots are an array. And on the right is a data assimilation model. And so this works great for um, non-earthquake sources uh, as well, such as landslides or volcanoes. So uh, Tahuka Mayeda uh, coded up a way to do this for tsunamis. 
And uh, Ian, or no, sorry, uh, Aditya Guzman and others uh, applied this to seafloor pressure measurements from the Cascadia Initiative. So using the real seafloor pressure me measurements from both the DPGs and the APGs, um, they were able to um, model the tsunami. On the right hand is the traditional source from the slip distribution, and on the left is the data assimilated wave field. You can kind of see as it hits each, each uh, DPG or APG, it um, uh, is kind of correcting the model and including new information in the model. Here we can just show one more time there. You don't get anything until it starts. Um, so this method um, actually works really well for the Haida Gwaii tsunami with Cascadia Initiative uh, measurements, but uh, the Cascadia Initiative was a temporary array and for tsunami warnings, you need uh, real-time uh, data, not, not picking up data a year later. Um, so in the previous talk, uh, Krista mentioned uh, advances that are going on with cabled networks and uh, I believe William Wilcock will talk about that um, after the break as well. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to point out um, that we could potentially use ship position data for tsunami forecasts. So this is showing uh, the little colored symbols are ships uh, yesterday. Uh, so I made this as a screenshot yesterday afternoon um, of ships offshore, um, kind of in the Northeast Pacific. This is a ship density map. So this is for a density of all of 2019. So, so at any given time, there are, there are probably 100 or so ships off, offshore Cascadia. And these ships, uh, this is just a zoom in, they're uh, required to transmit their position so they don't run into each other. Um, so they don't use just radar. They also um, uh, have a VHF marine band broadcast of what's called the automatic identification system. And they're always saying where they are. And you can see it from about 100 kilometers uh, away from land stations, but um, it is also picked up by satellites. And so several commercial satellite networks are now collecting that data um, and uh, and selling it. Also, government agencies get it. You can you can actually get some of the historical data for U.S. coastal regions for free. Um, I believe the International Space Station even has a an AIS receiver. So there have been uh, several previous uh, studies looking at GNSS on ships. Uh, so James Foster was one of the first people to point out that you can indeed. Uh, get kind of a decent uh, tsunami record from a uh, ship GPS. So this is from the 2010 uh, Chile earthquake. And uh, Daisuke Inazu uh, has been a real pioneer in this method and um, has looked at uh, GNSS based height uh, for measuring forecasting tsunamis. And then also has looked at uh, what you can do with uh, the heading and uh, uh, some of the navigation parameters. And uh, this is the Tohoku tsunami picked up on a GPS buoy. And then some ongoing work is uh, uh, putting uh, uh, a dual frequency GNSS on the Sekuliak in 2019 uh, in collaboration with Ethan Roth. So some, some work that we've done, uh, this is mostly Jakir Hosen's work, is using real ship position data, um, but then running simu simulations of uh, like having a, a Cascadia tsunami and see if you have these ship data, if you could get a warning. And the white triangle, or sorry, squares are places where we're, we're going to test the forecast. And then the magenta circles, that's Westport, Washington and Newport, or sorry, Westport, Washington and Newport, Oregon. Um, so we got the ship positions from Spire Global, which is a nano satellite company. And um, unfortunately the AIS signal has X, Y position, latitude, longitude, and also heading and a number of other things, um, but it doesn't give the vertical position. So we simulated that. 
And on the right are results from one of the simulations. So on the left is a reference wave field for a, a, a scenario magnitude 8.8, .8, uh, Cascadia earthquake and tsunami. And on the right is data assimilated using the ships. So the little dots are the different ship positions. Um, so you can see with this that, that you can get a, a decent uh, forecast with this. And then we did all sorts of tests with uh, kind of randomizing the positions of the ships or, or spreading them out and so forth. And let's see, so this is the uh, forecast with the ship data looking at in particular Westport and Newport. And uh, on the top is the, in dashed is the reference waveform and in green is the assimilated waveform. So this is uh, 100 minutes at Westport and Newport. And then um, since they're so close to the coast, you don't have a whole lot of, of uh, um, warning time. And so it's really important to get the algorithm to run quickly. So we looked at different assimilation time windows um, and compared that to the accuracy. So with, with about a, certainly with a 15 minute assimilation window, uh, you can get a good forecast. Um, and at 10, you could, you could get something. So um, uh, this could be of great utility. Um, and uh, so since this is supposed to be a short talk, uh, I talk kind of fast, uh, but uh, in conclusion, uh, ship-based GNS data is a promising low-cost complement to land-based and seafloor or observing systems for tsunami forecasting. Uh, we need to do more work to characterize the noise of ship-based GNSS, so now we have some of the Sekuliak data to work with. Um, adding the ship elevation data to the AIS broadcast would be valuable. Um, but Inazu has shown that you can do things with the existing AIS data. And also the satellite AIS data um, is pretty cool. Um, as promised for a lot of studies, there's 28 million daily messages. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it was kind of fun to work with. Um, so thank you to Spire for giving us data and NSF for funding. And here's a link to our paper. Um, Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Yep. Uh, Hopefully thanks, I Anne, had my your... sound on for that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anne, for your uh, very intriguing talk. I see John Alcott with your hand. Uh, would, you want, would you mind to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, Anne, I just had a, uh, a question. The, um, the orbit... Uh, the orbital pattern in the, um, in the tsunami signal is uh, is largely horizontal. There's very large displacement displacements in the horizontal direction, very small um, motion in the vertical direction. Have you checked the horizontal changes uh, with AIS? Um, I have not, but in in Azu has has done um, has a couple papers on that in 2020 and 2018. And on the vertical, I mean, the, the yeah, the, the, you can pick up a signal of about 10 centimeters. That's about the noise level we're seeing with GNSS. So, so a Tohoku type tsunami would be about a meter. And then the Chilean tsunami as recorded at Hawaii was about uh, 10 centimeters vertical. Yeah. I'm just saying the horizontal displacement should be significantly larger than the vertical, and uh, the GPS ought to be able to catch that very well with a very large signal to noise ratio. Okay. Yeah. Great point. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then my any more questions from our audience? Uh, if not, uh, I think I saw uh, Michael, uh, he would like to uh, raise some other questions into the open discussion. So Michael, would you like to talk about your question now? Um, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Krista, yeah, going back, um, also within our, within our discussion, like I said, with our colleagues at that time, 
prior to, prior to the Krakatoa uh, volcanic eruption, there, there was a, I believe it was in September, there was a 7.5 uh, earthquake event. Did the, did the system work for that event? To your knowledge. Okay. Yeah, so, so how do we describe if the system worked and according, you know, there'd be well, different answers to it. So basically, I know, yeah, so so let me <laughs> answer that. We had an extreme challenge. So that, that earthquake initially um, both um, the the local, the, they have a, a tsunami warning center in Indonesia. So this is the Palu event that we're talking yeah. about. So it was a strike slip earthquake, which, um, um, which yeah, it was extended from the epicenter and then had some parts under sea and then on the land, it was on land too. It was a very strongly felt, a uh, very strongly felt earthquake. Um, but um, there, one of the, so they detected the earthquake and they thought, you know, the, the, the tsunami warning authorities, they said, you know, initially they said, yes, there is a tsunami warning, there's a tsunami threat. Um, but then when they checked one of the tie gauges that they had data available, it didn't show any signal for, for a significant um, no tsunami. So they took down the tsunami warning, basically. They took it down um, because they did not have access to, because where the tsunami was generated was generated further um, further away um, um, fr further away where there was a subsidence. So what we now in Hintersight see is the very strong ground shaking in the Palu Bay probably caused these submarine landslides, which in effect then generated the tsunamis. And they had some tie gauges within the bay, of, uh, within Palu Bay, but they were not transmitting in real time. So they were blind at the tsunami warning center because they weren't able to see it. So there was this, this that's why I would say, you know, it, it did not, you know, it, it, if a working tsunami warning system would have, you know, we would have expected the tsunami warning would have continued and they would have not taken it down if they would have had access to this other data. And also there was a lot of, you know, within the tsunami warning system, you have to think about, you know, it was a very strong felt earthquake. I mean, it's what we've told people, you know, run for higher ground, but it was located within Indonesia where they're not used to seeing tsunamis. So it wasn't located, you know, <laughs> in the in the 2004 in, in that region. So, so that's why they sort of didn't, think that much about tsunamis and then they were over reliant on tsunami sirens that you know they thought they had tsunami sirens but they weren't working so there was all sorts of points of failure but you know it was a very challenging event because it was you know it was a strike slip event and then it, the, the 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 tsunami was not generated by the earthquake itself but what we call these secondary effects and that's what we're trying to address in the decade is these other types of of of, of sources and, and not get blindsided Okay. Well, I, I want you to, first and foremost, I want you to know that I, I'm going into this as your defense, okay? Yeah. Because I, I was, oh, hit, I was hit, I was hit, I don't know, I was hit with these questions in this conversation and, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I felt very defensive on it because I couldn't come up with the answers, but I said, I'm going to find the answers because there is a reason, okay? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not. Um, the other one was, and this is something that, that came along also, is that, what, if there is, if any, what protection is there against lawsuits if the system doesn't work and death tolls are, you know, and death tolls occur? I mean, is, is there anything written into that? Um, that de that well, depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so just, just going back to your first question, there is a very good very comprehensive report about Palu event published by UNESCO IOC evaluating the tsunami warning system. So yeah, you oh, can go and great. get much more detail on it. But to, with, you. to your regard to your question is that that varies from from country to country. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, there there have been lawsuits that have been, you know, they have been indictments in Chile and there have been indictments in Japan, both to authorities for not having um, what people consider the proper warning um, having been issued. Um, timeliness so um it, you know that we do have we have this case and 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 that's a, an issue also under study but but yeah there there have been it's it's very terrible because you're you know these these centers or emergency management officials are dealing with the data that they're dealing with and they obviously trying to do their best nobody you know would like something you know terrible to happen but sometimes these things happen and and that's why it's one of the reasons we need to even work further in improving our our forecast to make sure that everybody's at threat knows that they're a threat. But, you know, for some of these events, there's nothing like education 
and and person because there's just time is so little you know five to ten minutes there's it's very difficult to get a message out to to people and it's and you basically have to be educated to run to high ground and have places to run to i Thanks. absolutely agree thank you very much okay uh i see john alter your hand is still raising up uh do you still have a question john alter or is it from the last question Yeah, I think I got my question answered. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Good. I would like to add um, to Anne Sheehan's, you know, this is this concept of doing um, GNSS observations from ships is something that's very, very interesting. And NOAA also funded some research in it. And there's definitely some challenges how you bring that into operations. But just last week, we were, you know, part of the decade is also private. Part, you know, working with the private sector. And so Fugro is, is, is very interested in equipping its fleet with GNS grade um, 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 sensors and to add to, to try to contribute to our tsunami warning system. So, so it's something that's, that has been getting a lot of traction and, and, and it's under consideration. The challenge always is, is how do you bring in all these different data sources in this 10 minute framework that we're 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 we're, we're trying to address because that's where you know it's within the very short time frames is when the people you know most of the people die and the biggest impacts are so so that's you know working with our tsunami warning centers as we evaluate all these different sensors is very important to see how we're actually able to to work with this and and and, and use the use the data to save lives so krista will the fugro data be open access so you can it will noise and things like that. Yeah, well, we open access definitely. I know to the tsunami warning community, and you know, and and if there are researchers, and James Foster has been part of this discussion, so he's been on it. So also to researchers. So I think that's exactly what we need. We we want all the best minds working on on this problem. So so you know, for that type of. Um, that type of use, yes, but you know, of course, some of this data has its. They have some private access because of its its because of its commercial implications. But I think that that definitely could be worked with, and and we have to work with the scientists, you know, to to try to to answer these questions. So yes, I just wanted to. I'll, I'll be sure to keep you in the loop for any new discussions we have on this topic. Again. Great, thanks. Yeah, there's uh, one more question from Donna Shillington in the chat to Anne. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on how many subduction zones have the adequate density of ship traffic to enable this kind of analysis. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, most of them. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, just go to marinetraffic.com. I urge you to do that and just play. Uh, it is pretty cool. Um, Alaska is not that great, actually. Um, you can you kind of see the, the shipping tracks. Um, and so now I'm just looking at it, but it, yeah, I urge you to play with it yourself. Um, yeah, Japan is good, New Zealand. And you know, as long as the, if the fishing vessels are broadcasting, that that would be great. It's, uh, I think if they're less than 300 gross tonnage, they don't have to, but um, there's plenty of them shown. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, take a look at the map. Um, and let's see, Laura Kong had a comment on Pallery. Great. I just wanted to add that it's not only at the subduction zone that we need this GNSS data and this positioning, is if we go back to Kermadec Islands, you know, last week, you know, two weeks, it will be now two weeks, but, you know, as the tsunami is generated and starts traveling across the Pacific, we want to refine our forecast, and for that we need data, and that's why these other sources of data that can help us answer the question, is it really going to reach Chile and have what type of impact it's going to have, because in those eight, ten hours, you know, all these countries, you know, as it leaves the Kermadec and it's headed for, for Central America and South America, we want to need to, re there's an interest, you know, to, we'd like to be able to refine those forecasts and come up with better, so, so you know, preparations that need to be made and warnings that need to be given are given, but those that are not needed, um, then they would be, you know, not given. So we can, we can, we can do that much better. So we want to forecast what has to be forecast and, and be able to not, you know, put in alerts, um, areas that aren't going to be impacted. So it's looking not just in the subduction zone, but broader out as the tsunami travels the ocean. Thanks. Yep. 
I think there's uh maybe we can have one last question from uh Chen Tian of is for M. Like thank you for this very intriguing talk. And is it possible to also include satellite uh, altimetry data uh, to improve the spatial coverage of the input information? Um, yes, uh, it is. Um, so Ian Mulia has done some nice studies uh, actually using uh, ground-based radar. Uh, and then he's also used studies using radar altimetry from airplanes so you know there's many many so he was based he's based in japan and so there's many airplanes coming to and from tokyo and osaka at any given time and so he, he's used that in simulations and it's worked well and then i have seen papers on on satellite altimetry for this um i haven't done that myself though but thank you okay uh thank you for for two speakers and our audience for your participants. And I think we have run a little bit all of time. So uh, I guess we will have, a, instead of a 20 minutes break, we'll have a short five minutes break right now. And uh, thank again for our two speakers and we will reconvene at 2.05. Okay, shall we get started again? So now welcome to the um, third session of this on long-term monitoring. And um, with this session, we'll start with a uh, talk by William Wilcox, who is the Associate Director of School of Oceanography at the University of um, Washington and uh, Jerry Paros Professor in Seafloor Sensors. And um, he'll be talking about uh, a wide range of geophysical techniques that are being developed for monitoring offshore Cascadia. And then we'll be followed by um, two short talks, one by Zoe Krauss on um, building a multi-decadal microearthquake catalog for the Endeavor segment. Now, multi-decadal catalogs offshore are rare. And then a talk by Florian Peterson on, on subduction erosion and upper plate deformation induced by the 2014 um, magnitude 8.1 Iquique earthquake. And that talk is kind of included in this session because it represents a um, rapid response to that earthquake and a two year monitoring period, which is can qualify as long-term monitoring in the ocean environment for a rapid response effort. And it is also quite um, relevant, I think, because it touches on the need to um, combine both um, rapid response type uh, seismicity and geodetic studies with um, seismic imaging in order to understand how the um, outer accretionary wedge responds during earthquakes in order to see if there are geological uh, signatures that can be identified prior to um, earthquakes and tsunamis. So with that, I'll pass it on to William. And William, will you share your screen? Oh, I did want to mention, you, you know, for questions either in the chat or on part by holding up your hand. And if those of you who are worried about raising your hand with 96 um, plus participants, when your hand gets raised, your name goes to the top of the list with the hand. So it is easy to find your, your raised hand in case you are wondering. So, so William, will you, I'll pass it over to you. Um, thank you very much, Anne. Um, this is mostly a um, review talk. So I'm showing slides liberally from a lot of people and hopefully I've acknowledged everybody um, at the bottom of the slides, but if I've not, um, my apologies in advance. Um, so Cascadia is a somewhat puzzling and challenging end member subduction zone that I think if it wasn't off the coast of the US and it wasn't a major hazard, would probably receive quite a lot less attention. Um, the plates are generated at the Juan de Fuca Ridge and the Gorda Ridge, so it's young plate that's being subducted, so it's a warm subduction zone. Um, it's a very high sediment supply. Um, the trench is completely buried with sediments. The incoming plate interface is smooth. 
Um, and there's a complex accretionary um, prism um, that's quite extensive. Down dip of the seismogenic zone, um, there's extensive episodic tremor and slip. And the last great earthquake occurred in 1700. And the recurrence interval for the whole subduction zone is probably about 500 years and probably somewhat less um, in the southern part of Cascadia. And the seismogenic zone pretty much lies entirely offshore. And this is a map which shows 50 years worth of earthquakes with magnitude four and greater. And it's immediately apparent that there are very few earthquakes on um, the subduction zone, um, with the exception of down near Cape Mendocino and also up near the Nuka Fault. Um, and the simplest interpretation of that is that the fault is fully locked and building up strain to be released in great earthquakes. Um, but we don't really know that because we're only just starting to make the observations offshore um, that can determine whether that is the case. And so for my talk, I'm going to basically divide into three parts. I'm going to talk about earthquake studies that have been done offshore using ocean bottom seismometers. Um, then I will talk about ongoing geodetic work, trying to figure out the state of locking. And then I'll finally move on to talking about early warning off Cascadia because it is a significant earthquake hazard. And there are a lot of people or significant number of people on the coast living in the tsunami inundation areas um, where they will probably if one occurred now would be inundated with no place to go. Um, so to start this, you, there are two earthquakes on this plot um, that are located offshore Oregon, surrounded by the um, pink box. Um, and those are two um, high magnitude four earthquakes that occurred in 2004. Um, and that those earthquakes uh, motivated the first um, OBS study off the coast. Um, that was by Ann Trehu, and that involved both stations on land and 15 ocean bottom seismometers that were deployed for um, two years to try and study the clusters of earthquakes that occur at the sites of those two um, large earthquakes. Um, this was a challenging experiment. There was some noise on the instruments, um, a lot of bio bumps and other short duration events. But this experiment um, was able to demonstrate that these earthquakes either occur at the in-plate interface or very close to it and support the interpretation of these of being earthquake clusters that are associated with subducting um, seamounts or other um, asperities on the plate interface. Now, nearly all the other um, um, OBS observations on um, Cascadia were um, completed in a frantic five-year period at the start of the last decade. Um, the biggest experiment was the Cascadia Initiative, a community experiment, um, deployed 70 ocean bottom seismometers each year, um, starting it over the footprint in the north and then the south, back to the north and to the south. Um, and this covered both the Cascadia margin with densification off Grays Harbor and Cape Men near Cape Mendocino, but also covered the plate. At the same time, there were two um, PI-driven experiments by John Nabalek and Jochen Brownmiller. There was a year-long deployment on the Blanco transform and a two-year deployment on the Gorda deformation zone, of which I think the last year was sort of combined with the Cascadia Initiative experiment. And I've not shown the OBS locations on this, but there were CJ experiment involving Canada, Japan, and US in the first half of it, um, deployed a fairly dense network of mostly short period seismometers off Vancouver Island. And this Cascadia initiative and these related experiments has, has led to a huge number of studies, a lot of imaging studies, um, a lot of people finding sort of unique things to do with this data. Um, there have also been earthquake catalogs developed at Cape Mendocino and with the CJ data looking at the Nuka Fault and the Explorer Plate. But I'm just going to focus on showing you two earthquake catalogs, which is basically showing you seismicity um, along um, the sort of site in the seismogenic zone. Um, on the left is from Ian Stone et al. And that just shows this, this is a catalog that was focusing on looking at this region. Um, used um, typical um, sort of classical short-term, long-term detector association and then manual picking. And I think located about 271 earthquakes. On the right-hand side um, is work by Sue Billock and her student Emily Morton and Charlotte Rowe. 
and they are close to completing a four-year catalog um, for the Cascadia data using both land and offshore sensors. Um, and they're using a slightly more sophisticated subspace detector technique, um, which is based on waveform cross-correlation, but allows the use of multiple earthquake templates. And the catalog I'm showing here shows, I think about 2,100 earthquakes of which all but 500 are basically new, 500 are in existing catalogs. And you can see there's a significant um, difference between the northern part of the subduction zone off Washington and British Columbia, where there are a relatively small number of earthquakes. Um, more earthquakes off Oregon, um, mostly associated with asperities and then getting increasing numbers as you get down to Cape Mendocino. And those are interpreted as resulting from variations in crustal thickness, um, fluid pressure, and also the roughness of the incoming plate. Now, the, the Cascadia Initiative and that sort of five years of incredible data collection collected a wealth of data. Um, I think, I think we're close to 500 OBS deployments, um, about 300 years of seismic data. Now that's not very much by land um, criteria, but it's a lot in the oceans and that was a huge effort. Um, the spacing of the OBS though is quite large. In most areas, the nominal spacing of the Cascadia Initiative instruments was 35 kilometers. In most places, the observations were limited to sort of two nine month periods or 18 months. Um, now this experiment pioneered shallow water observations with shielded OBSs. Um, it's a noisy environment. There were some in instrument failures and some lessons learned. So we probably could do the experiment better now, but there's really no prospect of replicating um, the deployments of the CI Cascadia Initiative area, um, you know, with funding from NSF. Um, and, but there are questions that remain. It's unclear, you know, how many very small earthquakes are on the plate interface and whether there are times when there are more. Um, and if there's episodic tremor on the, the shallow plate interface associated with slow slip, you might need to observe quite densely for a, a decade to show that it either exists or doesn't exist. Now, moving on to offshore geodesy, um, there's a series of plots here. The two on the right is from Schmalzli et al. Um, they're shown quite extensively and they're geodetic models of land observations trying to predict the amount of locking on Cascadia. And basically the observations require that offshore, the fault is mostly locked but they can't predict whether that locking continues to the trench. So on the right hand plot, you have one that a fault that would be um, creeping quite a lot or slipping through slow slip close to the trench. On the left hand of the two right hand ones, you have one that's fully locked. Now the one slightly anomalous region in these maps is off Oregon, um, where there's relatively low coastal uplift. And that requires either that full locking is located further offshore or that you have only partial coupling or partial locking extending all the way to the trench. And so the objective of geodetic experiments is to try and figure out um, whether, whether the megathrust is fully locked and if so, where, and if it's not fully locked, to be able to detect shallow slow slip events that would be accommodating um, some of the slip. Well, there's a whole bunch of ways of trying to look for this and for looking for basically the plate locking, um, the standard method is um, GPS acoustic. And there you would have a network of transponders on the sea floor that would talk to a surface vessel, used to be a ship and now it's a wave glider because it's much cheaper, um, which then gets its position from GPS. And if you sit on site for a few days, you can average out uh, uncertainties in the ocean, water column velocities in the ocean, and can locate the center of that acoustic transponder network to a few centimeters. And if you come back and repeat those observations over time, you can figure out the plate velocity. And on the right hand side, um, this is a summary of all the um, experiments are either underway or planned, the deployments. And there are a series of sort of um, historical um, also legacy sites from very early acoustic GPS work that constrain the velocity of the Juan de Fuca plate. And now there are, are sites that are being placed near the deformation zone. And quite simply, if in a very simplistic sense, if the fault is locked, then you would expect uh, uh, one of these GPS acoustic sites that was on the toe of the subduction zone 
um, to be moving with the incoming plate. And if it's not locked, then it would be moving um, with the North American plate, the overriding plate. And there are now a couple of sites where there are observations, which seem to suggest like, a, a lot of locking as we would expect, but there are still large uncertainties. And there are many more sites where their data is being collected. So this will become a lot clearer over the next um, few years. Another uh, way that you can potentially get um, secular strain or locking is looking at absolute pressure. And I've been involved in an experiment with um, Mark Zumbeck and Glenn Sasagawa and several colleagues at University of Washington um, trying to develop this technique. And we deployed um, five benchmarks off central Oregon. And we use an instrument called the ASCPR, um, which basically is the of the ocean, the weight of the overlying ocean. And um, then you'd get an absolute um, measure of depth and you could come back at some later date, as, as late as you like, depending on the uncertainties, and measure it again and look at the deformation. And if the plate is locked, that's basically pushing the toe of the overriding plate down um, and then there'll be buckling and uplift. And so there are different patterns that you could attempt to get. And so we've got some preliminary um, data. And so at some point we will try and go back and get the second set of data to figure out and what we can learn about locking. Now, both techniques I've described are basically campaign observations. So if you want to look for slow slip, then you need to have continuous observations. And the standard way of doing this, or one standard way of doing this is with continuous pressure monitoring. That's been done in Hikarangi off Japan and Costa Rica. Uh, and again, the idea is that if you have a slow slip event, um, then the overriding plate near the, the um, the toe of the subduction zone will move up and then it will be there will be substance further towards the coast um, as you sort of unbuckle the plate where it was locked. Um, there were some um, absolute pressure gauges on some of the instruments in the Cascadia initiative, um, but they're too um, sparse and short lived to be able to detect a sort of reasonable sized slow slip earthquake. Um, so my student, Eric Fredrickson, um, has looked at that pressure data and what he's been able to do is to sort of do some sort of simulated studies of how you detect a slow slip event. Now, as a sort of seismologist, I'm used to thinking of profiles going sort of perpendicular to the subduction zone. But what Eric's shown is that to, you can do a much better job if you put the um, sensors along isobaths. And then you can use a differencing technique to very effectively remove the oceanographic signals for instruments at the same depth and potentially improve the sensitivity of your network. Um, and on the right hand side are just some a sort of idealized network with a spacing of instruments for about 50 kilometers that could be used um, to successfully detect slow slip events um, in central Oregon region um, where we suspect they might be occurring. Um, you could potentially have a, a less dense network. Now there are more um, GPS sites on the coast that could be combined with that. And just a couple of comments. One problem with the observations is pressure sensors tend to drift and the short observations make it quite hard to separate sort of um, seasonal oceanographic signals if you're just collecting data on a one-year OBS deployment. So ideally we would have 10-year deployments with dedicated pressure sensors and that's very doable. Um, they could be combined with acoustic GPS sites and there's a new technique that I won't talk about today called A0A calibration, which basically calibrates the pressure sensor against the internal pressure of the um, pressure housing, um, which can potentially eliminate a lot of drift and make it easier um, to discriminate slow slip events from oceanographic signals. Um, Mark Zumberg has um, developed something called the optical strain meter. And what this basically involves is um, laying a few hundred meters of a cable with optical fibers just beneath the sediments. Um, and then using laser interferometric techniques to measure changes in the optical length. Now the trick here for this is that you the, the, that can change with both temperature and strain, but there it actually uses two optical fibers with different temperature sensitivities and is then able to can correct for the temperature and that can give you an instrument that's potentially very, very sensitive for detecting slow slip events. And he's working with Noel Bartlow to do an experiment which will be deployed soon. And this is motivated by work by Noel Bartlow, 
who's looking at basically the budget of slow slip um, down dip of the lock zone um, from land-based GPS data. And there's some evidence right at sort of threshold of resolution that there may well be slow slip offshore and that identified some locations on the left-hand side where that may be. Um, so that basically provides a potential target and they're still um, selecting the finalized site. Uh, but they will be doing a two-year experiment to see whether they can detect slow slip with a very sensitive instrument. Um, another technique um, to measure detect slow slip is with borehole sensors. And John Collins and Jeff McGuire working collaborations, um, collaborations with Canadian scientists, they've deployed off Vancouver Island um, a package down a IODP borehole, um, which includes a tilt meter and a seismometer. That was deployed, I think, or operational for about a year. There was then a problem with the connector and it's now out of the water, but the plan is to put it back in site, on site. But tilt is potentially also very sensitive to slow slip, um, especially if it occurs right beneath um, the borehole. And this is from some work by Jeff McGuire who looked at the data they had um, and was trying to see whether you could any evidence for slow slip events that were being dynamically triggered by sort of large global earthquakes during the time of the deployment. And the bottom line was they didn't find any, but it was only a short deployment. And again, we don't really have any idea of if there is slow slip, what the recurrence interval is. I should also let people know that there is a drilling proposal that was um, submitted um, that would um, drill holes both off Vancouver Island, additional holes off Vancouver Island and off Central Oregon and would take uh, advantage of the cabled observatories there to basically have fairly sophisticated instrumented boreholes. Um, and these could make a variety of measurements um, to, to, to look for slow slip. Um, mentioned tilt, you could also put an optical strain meter down a borehole. And then the classic way of using a borehole is to look at formation pressure, look at um, changes in volumetric strain. And again, this is a very potentially very sensitive method. And on the right hand side, I show some example, an example from Nankai, um, where two um, boreholes were used to detect slow slip events, which just had sort of centimeters of motion um, and about 30 kilometers beneath the sensors. And they were quite clearly observable in the pressure signals that recorded in the corked observatories. So as a sort of summary of geodesy, um, it's underway and there are multiple techniques that can be used. It's very challenging to do and it's expensive. Um, and if you want to do, you want to search for slow slip events, you're going to have to have sustained observations that potentially in a lot of places to show, demonstrate that they don't occur. Obviously, if you find them, you find them, but you may have to observe for a decade before you can be sure they're not occurring. Um, I've shown a couple of slides here from the subduction zone 4D planning. Um, they're still deciding um, which subduction zones they want to go to, but there's a lot of scientific motivation to get very dense geodetic observations offshore to understand fault patchiness if there is slipping. Um, but that's going to be extremely challenging and expensive to do. Um, and as I think a, a field where you're re really crying out for some new technology, something um, maybe I guess acoustic instar doesn't work, but something, some new breakthrough technology I think is going to be required to get the observations at the density that some people would like. Now, if we move on to earthquake early warning, that's been in California for a while, just arrived in Oregon and Washington. It's going to be formally released, I think, later this spring. Um, and that uses networks of seismometers to detect um, the P wave at ne um, from earthquakes at a nearby sensors and then provide warning of the damaging S and surface waves that arrive later um, with an increasing warning time the further you get away from the epicenter and no warning time if you're right on top of a shallow earthquake. That is currently based entirely on land seismometers in Cascadia, even though one of the major sources of earthquakes offshore um, um, GPS or GNSS sites are part of this and they will eventually, I think, be included in the warning. But again, there's no immediate plans to have offshore observations. 
There's also a very significant tsunami risk. And this is just a slide showing that the three NOAA tsunami buoys that are off our coast um, will record the tsunami wave from a Cascadia earthquake after the tsunami's already hit the coast. So they're really designed for far field warning. Um, and clearly, if you had pressure sensors close to the coast, they would be able to record it, the tsunami more quickly and potentially provide a warning to the land. Um, as Anne showed in her talk, um, it's not the only way of potentially doing that, um, but it's, it would be a way that would be used sort of an established technique um, that people understand. So with funding from the Moore Foundation, uh, as part of their efforts to support the development of earthquake early warning, a group of us at the University of Washington sort of did a feasibility study for offshore early warning. And this is a sort of illustrative diagram which shows how it might work if you had a network of relatively dense um, seismometers and pressure sensors off the coast, um, they would be able to detect an earthquake before it arrived at the coast and potentially provide, depending on how, how far offshore it was, a very small amount of warning to the people on the coast nearest and an increasing amount of warning as you move further away. Um, and that even a small amount of warning is potentially quite useful for people who need to evacuate um, a tsunami region so they don't get injured uh, in the earthquake. And then if you had pressure sensors or and potentially other instruments sensing the tsunami, the aim would be to a provide a tsunami warning um, a long time before the earth, the waves um, reach the coast. Um, obviously in a very large earthquake, the shaking is the warning, but there's possibility that you might have tsunami earthquakes which have less shaking. Um, there's potential benefit of um, letting emergency managers know um, how bad um, the inundation is going to be. And then there is more time to actually make a decision for a tsunami propagating up the Straits of Juan de Fuca and into Puget Sound. Now, the question you might ask is, well, can we do early warning with the existing scientific observatories? Um, both the US with the Ocean Observatories Initiative Cabled Array um, and Ocean Networks Canada Neptune Observatory have these very um, capable multidisciplinary cabled observatories offshore, which supply um, a lot of power and bandwidth to a small number of nodes. And you can immediately see, if you look at this plot, that the Canadians sort of have a better configuration. They have less space to cover and they have a loop network, um, which covers the, you know, covers their region pretty well, particularly when you remember the north of that um, little green triangle, which is Tofino, there really is no population on the outer coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and so the Canadians, Ocean Networks Canada has actually taken the lead um, in doing the Canadian earthquake early warning. And so they have a system which they're operating in collaboration with the Canadian Geological Survey, which includes both sensors on land, but also accelerometers on their nodes offshore. They also um, have a tsunami warning system on the Ocean Networks Canada Observatory. Um, and so they're pretty well covered. The density is not as high as you would like it to be for offshore early warning, but they have some, they're integrating their network into it. In the US, it's a little harder because the cabled observatory really just goes onto one place off the coast of Oregon. Um, and so it's probably better thought of as a, both a research facility, which is what NSF created it as, and as something where you could potentially do an earthquake early warning prototype that would um, protect a small amount of the Oregon coastline. Now, most of the Ocean Observatory Initiative cabled array um, on the margin is actually devoted to water column experiments, looking at the circulation of the ocean and coast and up upwelling. There is um, geophysical instrumentation at the base of the slope and on a hydrate ridge, but the three nodes that I've circled um, with red, um, they have no um, geophysical instrumentation. So a really obvious thing would be to instrument those. And that's, um, that would potentially be of use to look at these clusters of earthquakes that Antrehu's looked at in great um, detail. Now, if you want to develop a more sophisticated system or extensive system, we actually costed that. And if you developed a system to cover the whole of the US portion um, using an observatory like the um, 
OOI or ONC observatories where you basically have a trunk cable with primary junction boxes and then an array of sensors um, connected to it that would cost about 500 million. You can come up with a more streamlined system where you put the seismometers and pressure sensors in line with the cable, um, but that would still cost 300 million and that's quite um, costly considering that presently the, uh, the um, targeted budget for earthquake early warning on land to operate that each year is about 30 million. So you're talking about 10 times that cost. So this is going to be challenging to raise the money to do this. Another thing that I want to at the finish my talk about is to talk about the potential for using submarine telecommunication cables. Um, the green lines on this plot show that there are a large number of telecommunication cables off the coast, particularly landing in Oregon, but also coming in to Puget Sound and to Vancouver Island. Now these are you know, carrying large amounts of telecommunication data. They don't do any science. They have a design lifetime of 25 years, but they often don't last that long because they become obsolete. And so it's not a static distribution. This, this distribution is changing at all times as new cables are landed and old ones are retired. Um, but there's potential to use these for early warning. Um, with a variety of techniques. Um, there's some mention earlier of distributed acoustic sensing, and this is basically a technique that uses um, Rayleigh scattering in a fiber to turn an optical fiber up to distances that can approach 100 kilometers into something akin to a line of very sp closely spaced seismometers. It's being used in land extensively to detect earthquakes, and there've been several studies, and this is just one from Nate Lindsay, which have shown that it works offshore. What's really interesting from this particular study is they also show it's sensitive to signals at uh, periods of about a thousand seconds, which is what you would need to detect tsunamis. And for DAS, you need a dark fiber, and there are no dark fibers in a typical telecommunication cable, telecommunication cable. so you'd either have to add new fibers to new installations, just to the near shore portions to support DAS, or you could potentially repurpose retired cables. Um, a couple of other techniques that, um, that sort of use fibers as ultra-stable laser interferometry, and this is also a technique that um, measures strain, but it measures it along the entire length of a telecommunication cable, so it's basically an integrated measure, um, and that has been shown to um, detect earthquakes. This is from a, a paper by Giuseppe Mara et al. Um, and if you make the observations from both shore stations, you can potentially localize a signal. And this requires equipment in the shore station and access presumably to the fibers that are transmitting telecommunications data. So it's a little more intrusive on the telecommunications company, but it can potentially locate the first lo place of shaking on a cable. Um, optical polarization, this is a paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago by Zhang Wen Zhang. And this is a, another integrated technique and right, this one now looks at how the polarization of light changes passing along a cable as that cable deforms either as it's squeezed, stretched or rotated. Um, and the real advantage of this is it requires no new equipment in the shore because the telecommunication companies are actually monitoring um, the state of polarization. And the disadvantage part of this is it's another integrated measure and there's no way of localizing and it's probably going to take quite a bit of work to fully understand what it's sensing, but it can potentially sense, uh, certainly can sense earthquakes and potentially may be able to sense tsunamis. And finally, um, Krista mentioned smart cables. This is his idea of putting acceleration, pressure and temperature sensors and maybe more, but that's the basic package into the repeaters that are located about every 75 kilometers along telecommunication cables. Um, that's motivated by both climate change and early warning and, and also basic science. And this is a tough sell because people um, who install telecommunications cables across the oceans, they want them to carry as much data as possible and reliability is incredibly important. Um, and so there's costs of making a reliable smart repeater and potentially costs of reducing the telecommunications capacity. Um, but these are coming, they're coming on regional cabled observatories. The Portuguese in particular, as one example, have announced that they're going to have a, a cable going from Portugal to the Azores to Madeira and back, which will have smart capability. And that's a big deal because that means that the telecommunications infrastructure suppliers are going to have to develop these repeaters and we hopefully will demonstrate that they're reliable and then we can start thinking about putting them on transoceanic cables. 
And so my final diagram is just some idealist thing about how you might, on a time scale of maybe 20 years, um, get a significant amount of the infrastructure you would like for earthquake early warning and tsunami early warning using a combination of distributed acoustic sensing close to the shore, um, the state of polarization, ultra, la ultra stable laser interferometry further off, and then smart repeaters, um, which would be distributed, you know, would, would be, I think, particularly useful both for getting further offshore and for the tsunamis. And the one thing to point out is that smart repeaters, as well as provided warning, may be quite important in terms of understanding what all these other fiber sensing techniques are actually measuring and quantifying those things, which I think you need um, for accurate earthquake warning and tsunami warning. And so with that, I will finish only a couple of minutes over my time. Hey, thank you very much, William. That's an awful lot of information to um, think about both what's been done and what we can look forward to in the next uh, decades. Are there any questions for William? I'm seeing a lot of clapping, but no hands raised. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next talk um, by Zoe Krauss, who's a graduate student at the um, School of Oceanography at the University of Washington. We have a short talk scheduled by Zoe. So Zoe, um, do you want to share your screen? Yes, I'll get this started. Okay. All right, that looked good? Looks good. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Anne. Okay, so um, with that wonderful overview from William um, of all the kinds of offshore capabilities that we have had and look forward to having in Cascadia, um, what I'll be talking about is more of a specific application and example of what we can do with this offshore monitoring. Um, so I've been working on building a multi-decadal earthquake catalog um, for a segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And so, um, you know, in this geohazard session, when we talk about cable to raise, um, we often talk um, in how valuable the instantaneous data is, um, but the long-term duration of the observations themselves um, are also really valuable. And so I'll be showing an example of that here. Um, so my study, this catalog, um, is using the Ocean Networks Canada Neptune Cable Array, which William showed briefly, um, that comes in a loop off of Vancouver Island. So here we are in Seattle in the Cascadia um, subduction zone is running through here and the Juan de Fuca Ridge um, is running further um, kind of north-south, further off the coast. And we are getting OBS data um, from this cable network um, from a node on the Endeavour segment right here. Um, and so if we zoom in, um, we see um, here I'm just sh uh, showing high resolution bathymetry overlain by the main tectonic boundaries. And we see that we have a cute little OBS network here in the center that I've marked the uh, seismometers here with these green triangles. Um, and the Endeavour segment itself um, is gives us a really rich data set. We have these two um, overlapping spreading centers to the north and to the south, so really complicated regional tectonics. And also um, one of the most active observed hydrothermal vent fields in the ocean. Um, so I've marked the five main fields here in the center with these yellow stars. Um, so we get a lot of seismicity at this ridge. Um, and we're measuring a lot with this OBS network, which is pretty cool. Um, and in terms of mid-ocean ridges and the Endeavour segment specifically, it's really important to get data on a long time scale um, because these ridges undergo cyclical activity. Um, and that is of course driven by the accumulation of extensional strain. Um, and at the Endeavour segment specifically, that strain is relieved um, through dike injection, which of course causes um, micro earthquake swarms that we can observe with these OBS. Um, and with a 52 millimeter spreading rate per year, and if we assume an average dike width is only around a meter, um, we expect this cycle to repeat itself every 20 years. Um, so observations on that order of magnitude um, allow us to really study um, holistically um, and completely these uh, mid-ocean bridge segments. So we're really lucky to have over 20 years of OBS observations, um, both from this cabled array at the Endeavor and also a few OBS deployments in the past. Um, uh, a longer one in 2003 to 2006. Um, and then of course the ONC came online in 2011. Um, unfortunately only one instrument deployed um, for the first five years, but then in 2016, we've been getting continuous data 
um, from at least a four station array. Um, and we'll have that going into the future. Um, and so we know that the last kind of uh, rupture event on this ridge culminated um, in 2005. Um, so that's kind of when that cyclical activity, that seafloor spreading cycle restarted. Um, so it's been 15 years since that last um, dike emplacement swarm. And hopefully, you know, some point maybe in the near future, um, we'll be able to actually measure the next um, event um, in real time. Um, and also, you know, be able to piece all of this history together and tell the whole story of the evolution of this mid-ocean bridge, which is really neat. Um, and we actually automate these incoming, uh, we automate earthquake detections on this incoming data. Um, and that allows us to detect and locate these earthquakes um, in near real time. Um, and uh, something I want to emphasize um, in terms of, you know, this is geohazard session is that even though we have a pretty sparse OBS network, you know, it's really not, we don't have a wide swath of stations all over um, many, many kilometers like we might be able to get on land. Um, the thing that we have in the oceans is uh, really high quality velocity models. Um, so we're able to run over these sites with a streamer. And so we have a velocity model at the Endeavor segment that actually is 200 meter grid spacing. Um, and so that kind of makes up for the fact that we can't have, um, or at least we just have one node um, instrumented with an OBS network. We're still able to um, locate earthquakes um, to the point where we can associate them with individual vent fields. So here I'm just showing earthquake density and we see um, earthquake density in a half a kilometer grid. And we see that we can um, pick out the most um, active vents um, even with this sparse network. And also if we zoom out, um, and we look on the segment scale, we see that we have less than a 10 kilometer spread in earthquake locations, um, even very far from the network, as well as a pretty strong agreement to, um, you know, the tectonic boundaries and where we would expect these earthquakes to occur. So we're pretty confident that we're getting good earthquakes, uh, earthquake locations um, with just this short network. Um, so yeah, just in conclusion, um, these cable arrays are really allowing us to make really quality observations um, and really valuable long-term observations um, when we couple them with a really high quality velocity model. Um, and of course that's valuable to a range of disciplines, both studying you know, small scale venting, um, larger scale regional tectonics. Um, and I also wanna make the point that, you know, even if we're only able to instrument one or two nodes on these cabled networks, that could be really valuable on a subduction zone to make observations. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. So are there any um, quick questions before we move on to our next short talk? And then I do wanna point out, we have a block of time um, after the next talk for a more general question and answer and discussion session related to um, the monitoring. So I can ask a quick question if you can. Uh, so, so Zoe, yeah, go ahead, Ann. you used a, a kurtosis picker. Um, so did you explore other automatic pickers and you know, how, how did it perform? Um, I haven't done much um, kind of exploration on different pickers. So we do use just an STLT picker um, and then we refine the picks using kurtosis. Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually a detector that um, was developed by William for um, the axial seamount. And so it's specifically kind of tuned to deal with fin whales in the area and other things like that. Um, so no, I haven't explored much in terms of other pickers. Um, I would assume that would improve um, the data set for sure, but you know, there's a lot of seismicity at the Endeavor. So I guess finding numbers of earthquakes isn't um, a problem, but yeah, no, we haven't tried other things, but I'm sure that um, it, it's something that could be improved. Yeah. Okay, thanks. No, it looks like it's working great. Lots of events. Okay, thank you for that question. And let's move on now to um, the second short talk in this session by Florian Peterson, um, who is a graduate student at Geomar in Kiel, Germany. And I think we've seen his name as a co-author um, earlier this morning. So Florian, do you want to um, go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, so we now move further south to Chile, 
And this is talk is about our observations of subduction erosion and upper plate deformation induced by the 2014 Iquique earthquake in northern Chile. So this study is in cooperation with the Chilean Seismogeling Network, the Universidad de Chile, and as well the Oregon State University. So first, um, the northern Chile seismic gap, which is outlined here by the white line on the right map, uh, has last ruptured in 1877 with a magnitude about nine and triggered as well a significant tsunami in the Pacific Ocean. So, and this seismic gap is uh, one of the best monitored because there's since 2016, several uh, real-time broadband stations have strong motion seismographs and continuous GPS measurements. And this seismic gap was then partially filled in 2014 by the Kiko earthquake, which ruptured the central area here and left as well a southern region, which is still capable of producing an magnitude eight earthquake. Um, and what I mentioned here is that this clear discrepancy between onshore stations located along the coast and the offshore rupture area of the Kiko earthquake. So this is a great example why we need offshore geophysical monitoring to, um, to understand these shallow rupture processes. So in rapid response to the Kiko earthquake in 2014, um, the first OBS network was deployed here on the left side, these green triangles, um, eight months after the main shock, um, which was a joint effort by the, the CSN, Universidad de Chile, and GEOMAR, which large support of the Chilean Navy. So this first network was then um, recovered and redeployed with SONNE in end of 2015 in the framework of the GUC project. And then the final recovery took place in 2016 by Langseth in connection with the seismic project pictures which conducted a large grid of long offset reflection and wide angle reflection seismic. So this is, um, gives us a large, um, unique marine data set, which is um, now published uh, soon in several um, papers and some of the MCS lines already published last year. And I think these of these publications are one, only the possible, or only the top of possible findings from this unique data set. Um, and what I now is want to focus on the aftershock seismicity with, from the rupture area together with one of the MCS lines from this controlled source experiment. So um, here you can see now the aftershock activity eight months after the main shock with focus on the rupture area. So this is the rupture area from another co-seismic slip model. But striking on it is here that we have an intense uh, aftershock seismicity in the uptip area of the Kika earthquake, which is what occurred in this region. And we have a clear limit towards the trench. And as well, we do not observe significant seismicity westward of the trench. So when we now take one of the multi-channel seismic lines, which crosses the uptip limit and compare this with the aftershock seismicity we located with our OBS networks, we can now um, correlate these together. So on top you have the um, pre-stack depth migrated seismic data uh, together with the seismicity. And interesting is, interesting is that we have um, a large number of aftershock seismicity that occurred in the upper plate. And the aftershock seismicity as well correlates to large scale normal faults we observe in the seismic image. And so we interpret this sequence of seismicity as indication for active subduction erosion during the co-seismic and post-seismic phase. So if we link this observation now from um, one earthquake cycle to several earthquake cycles, so to long-term permanent deformation, um, we have then repeated co-seismic, post-seismic deformation associated with subduction erosion. This forces then to extensive faulting of the upper plate. So this is what we can observe as permanent deformation in the seismic image. Um, and this permanent information of fracturing is what we can observe in the frontal wedge where we have an increased reflection amplitude um, in comparison to the middle fork. So um, when we work at one, as when we just conclude this, so we have uh, marine seismology and um, with long-term monitoring, this 
crucial part really um, to reveal and understand these shallow subduction processes. For example, our rapid response in eight months is really quick. Um, and when we see what we have learned from this uh, deployment is that our investigation is that we can observe active subduction erosion in the post seismic phase, which leads then to extensive faulting uh, in the upper plate um, of the seismic shelling uptip limit. And over long term, permanent deformation, we have migration of the upper plate through the uptip limit, which is here just image in a uh, conceptual model, through the uptip limit is fractured during the co-seismic and post-seismic phase, which leads then a weak fractured frontal wedge, which is likely to creep. So just I want to wrap this up that our offshore long-term monitoring is important together with rapid response OBS deployment to reveal such processes in the shallow subduction zone. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Florian. Are there any questions um, for Florian or for Zoe or for William? Okay, there's a, a question here for um, Zoe from Hyunhua Gong. Did you look at the location results of all the micro earthquakes? Could you identify detailed fault zone structures and what will you pursue with these located events? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we're starting to um, kind of look at these detailed <coughs> locations and trace them to, um, in terms of detailed fault zone structures, um, a big concern or a big thing that they could be related to is the overlapping spreading centers to the north and south. And so we're starting to find um, that a lot of the earthquakes are more related to um, those structures rather than the vent fields themselves. Um, and our earthquake location, you know, getting that resolution is essential to um, seeing that. Um, so yeah. Um, in terms of what we're going to pursue with this, this is kind of tells us, you know, not just about the Endeavor segment specifically, but also um, how um, kind of different uh, the stresses that cause earthquakes are partitioned um, along different parts of the segment throughout the whole cycle, the seafloor spreading cycle. Um, and that's kind of telling us about just mid ocean ridge dynamics in general. Um, so, yeah, in terms of what we're doing with these events, building a catalog um, that will be publicly available for lots of people to look at and maybe pursue their own questions, um, but also just trying to tell the story of, you know, um, where stress is concentrated and dealt with in different parts of the cycle. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. We have another question here from uh, SparWeb for anybody. Um, Spar is asking whether he thinks, whether anyone thinks the seaward dipping normal faults could cause an earthquake big enough to produce a tsunami. Does Florian, can, would you like to address that can, perhaps? And yeah. um, that's an, it's a good point because um, what we observe is that we have this activity at these normal faults in the whole um, post-seismic phase we observed for these 23 months. So this is um, a phase, uh, uh, um, slip that's it's more I mean after slip than co-seismic slip so um, and as well this frontal wedge was active with large precursory events and creep and so slip events so um, I'm not sure if this is uh, uh, it's kept countable for another seismic cycle if this can causes large um, tsunami but uh, for this case it was more like a stop of um, rupturing towards the trench. So, so we had more like a diffuse seismicity than an up to seismic slip, co seismic slip. Yeah. Okay, now we have another question um, from. Joseph Burns for Zoe, and uh, he's asking whether it's correct that the earthquakes are in the center, but not at the ends of the Endeavor segment. Is that 
Yeah, I can just quickly maybe share my screen again if we have a just a second to, rather than just talking, it's easier to show. Um, so here where I'm showing the segment scale, um, earthquake density patterns, um, the color scale kind of um, saturates in the center, but yes, kind of what you're saying is correct. And I do wanna note, this is just for the past five years of seismicity. Um, so yeah, we're seeing most of the earthquakes are kind of located in the center of the segment, but they're not aligning with the ridge axis itself. They're almost tracing a line between the propagating tips um, rather than on the main ridge segment. Um, and we do also see activity within the ridge propagating tips, but yeah, nothing kind of in between or on the northern or much of the, on the southern axis of the endeavor itself. Um, so we're still kind of trying to figure out what could be going on here. Um, in the past, kind of with, diff with different, in a different part of the spreading cycle, we've seen a lot more activity um, on the northern part of the axis and the southern part of the axis, but that's kind of, yeah, just what we're seeing now um, is just um, mainly in the center, um, but kind of more spatially seems to be driven by these propagating tips. So yeah, trying to figure out how, you know, that kind of disconnect between where the propagating tips end and where the stress field of them begins is something we're thinking about. But um, yeah, that's the general pattern we're seeing. Thank you for the question. Great, now do we have any more questions? Um, yes, we do have a question now from Ann Sheehan to William. Ann's asking, 300 million for a cable network may seem high, but do you have an estimate of what the economic cost of a Cascadia tsunami would be? Um, yes, there are estimates, and I'm not sure whether I could remember them, but they're in the tens of billions. Um, but, you know, the question is, the more germane question is how much do you save by having an earthquake early warning system? And obviously lives are important, and particularly on the coast. Um, you know, there are a large number of people living in areas where they can't easily get to higher ground. And so having an offshore warning system in conjunction with vertical evacuation and people training, then it's potentially benefit beneficial. But um, I don't think there's been an assessment of what an offshore warning system would save in terms of um, financial costs. And there's, when people do that, there's a lot of argument about how much one life is worth, for instance. When you, but it will be a very, it will be very substantial, and I've, you know, because we're not hardened like Japan for a big earthquake. So, thank you. So, are there any more questions? Well, I think we have time for a um, three-minute break before we start up with the. Uh, next session on um, slope stability and fluid processes and hazards related to, to flow. I think there is one more question in the chat. Is there a question? Oh yes, there is one more question. Yeah, that just came in. Um, for Zoe. Great talk. Have you calculated the cumulative moment? Another question came in after that. The cumulative moment of the seismicity. How is that compared with the extension budget? Hi, right. yeah. Um, so we do, we are calculating moments for these earthquakes and are able to come up with estimates of the cumulative moment release, um, but I haven't yet compared them to the extension budget. That would be something that would be really interesting to do, um, especially now that we have almost 20 years of data. Um, um, so yeah, I guess left to do yes still on the list. Thank you. And we have a question here for um, Florian from Steve Hicks. Were you able to either directly image or infer from your OBS detected seismicity the fault in the overriding plate that hosted the magnitude 6.7 foreshock that occurred two weeks before the Iquique main shock? And if I recall, that was a thrust earthquake. Yeah, right. It was, um, and it's really hard to compare the foreshock sequence um, allocations, uh, I mean, from onshore, and there's it's a large shift from our OBS seismicity. So we could not now infer um, our OBS deployment with the seismicity of the, or this event. But may I have, take a closer look on this? Yeah. Yeah, I have a, a, a question related to that. Now, did you see any systematic shifts? There was some overlap between the um, aftershock study based on the land network and then your study. Um, are there any systematic uh, 
Yes, that strong. you see when you have OBSs and yeah. a 3D velocity model or 2D. Yeah, there's a strong east-west shift from the land what observed seismicity to our, so that's pretty clear. Um, and, the small, and, and what about in depth? And the depth, uh, there's a lot of events that are um, related in these um, catalogs published earlier, um, related to the uh, plate interface, but now they're shifting more in the upper plate, so they're and different to yeah these ones. So our our velocity model has a huge change in the shallow part. So where we are we as deployed. So that's the thing brings back. I think Anne Sheehan mentioned the other day that off New Zealand um, with OBSs generally the depths shift upwards, and that's also something I've seen in yeah, um, sure. Central right. Chile and off Oregon. Yeah. So I think you know the OBSs Maybe are essential the for. Velocity um, model really understanding the relationship of the earthquakes to the structures mm -hmm. offshore. Yeah. Well, I, um, are there any more questions for this grouping? And if people want to state their question, you know, it's the hands show up quite well, actually. So if you want to raise your hand rather than type your question into the chat at the, after the next session, feel free to do that. We will be catching the raised hands as well as the um, chat questions. And with that, we'll move on to our, our final section um, on, uh, we have a talk to two relatively short keynotes, um, one by Maureen Walton at the USGS on um, massive park mark fields. Both of these um, coming talks were related, are, using high resolution seismic data to um, look at offshore hazards. So um, to not waste any more time, we'll move on now to uh, Maureen Walton, who is uh, a research geologist at the USGS Pacific Coastal Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz. And she'll be talking about some massive pockmark fields. So Maureen, do you want to share your screen and um, yeah, let's give this a try. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Looks like I'm... I hear you and great. I see you, so... Great. All right, let's give this a try. Yep, your screen is being shared perfectly. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, all right, I'm just going to turn on my laser pointer before I forget here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks for um, having me to talk about uh, some new exciting, hopefully exciting work that we've been doing offshore of Central California, which is a fairly understudied part of the California um, plate margin. So without further ado, I've got a, quite a bit to get through. So um, uh, first, a brief motivation for why we started studying uh, Central California in the first place. We originally uh, were funded to uh, look at this area because it's being considered for offshore wind farm development. And this is just a schematic of the type of wind farm that might be eventually uh, installed in an area like this. They're actually, they would actually be floating wind turbines and these turbines are really, really massive. They're um, larger than the Statue of Liberty and they're anchored to the seafloor using really large uh, chains. And then they sort of plug into uh, seabed cable systems and then go on shore to exist and ideally plug into existing power grid infrastructure. And so when you're anchoring something into the seafloor, you need to understand seabed stability hazards due to things like seismic shaking, mass wasting, sediment transport, transport and subsurface fluid flow. So we were funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to go out and kind of do a geophysical reconnaissance survey. So over the past few years, we've done a number of different surveys. We've done, we started with a surface ship survey on the NOAA ship Rainier, which is a hydrographic vessel. So we collected a uh, multi-beam using that ship and we also towed a Sparker multi-channel uh, seismic reflection system. And we collected, uh, you can see our track lines here and you can see the California inset in the corner, kind of showing the, the region that we're looking at here, fairly, fairly big region offshore of South Central California. And all of the lines that you see here are our Sparker lines and we also collected a little bit of chirp on the yellow lines. We've also been working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, um, which has been a really wonderful collaboration. And we've been able to uh, work with them to collect autonomous underwater vehicle uh, data as well. 
And so those data are shown in the grayscale patches and include ultra high resolution multi-beam, or sorry, ultra, ultra high resolution bathymetry using their, their AUV, as well as coincident uh, chirp data using that AUV. So very noise-free AUV data. So I'll be focusing on the geophysical data that we collected, uh, but just know that we also went out uh, on, an, on another survey in 2019 and Ambari has also gone out to collect samples and cores to sort of ground truth these results. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna be talking about is pockmarks, which is a potential hazard that's prevalent in this uh, entire study area. So first of all, what are pockmarks? Uh, so pockmarks are geomorphic features that are typically uh, pretty wide, a couple hundred meters in diameter, not uncommon, and fairly shallow, you know, 10 meters or so deep, that often form in extensive uh, fields. And these are fairly common in the world's ocean. They occur in a number of different morphological environments. And pretty much just to form a pockmark, all you need is some sort of mechanism to either remove and or prevent sediment from being deposited. And a lot of the time, as you can see in this schematic diagram, this, uh, the pockmark formation is generally attributed to fluid or gas just discharge, but we really don't know a lot about why pockmarks form, and it certainly seems like this is not always the reason that they form. So the Big Sur pockmark field, which is in our study area, this is a map showing a really similar area as I was showing earlier. You can see all of those points are our pockmarks that we've mapped. Uh, we've mapped around 5,000 individual pockmark fe features over an area of uh, 1,300 square kilometers. This is the largest known pockmark field in North America, and it's one of the bigger ones in the world as well. I'll show you a close-up just so you can get a sense for what these things look like speckling the seafloor. And our pockmarks are pretty typical size, a couple hundred meters across and about five meters deep. They do occur in a relatively wide range of water depths in our study area, 500 to 1200 meters. And we did notice in our mapping, this is a, a relative density map, that there are some areas that have relatively denser pockmark occurrences, and we're still not quite sure why that is. We're looking into that now. And uh, these, this is not the first time this pockmark field has been has been noticed. So Charlie Pollitt and Bari and colleagues first started studying these pockmarks about 20 years ago. And uh, their initial results showed that these pockets, there's no evidence for, for methane, uh, methane gas or exotic fluids in the upper 50,000 years of, of sedimentary record. So we wanted to go back and take a closer look at why those, why those pockmarks are there. So I'll show you a close up of an AUV bathymetry survey from that, from this little area where that box showed up. And so this is just a, you know, kind of a zoom in here of, of what these pockmarks actually look like. You can see that they're remarkably round. Uh, and then I'll show you another close up even farther in of these couple of pockmarks and a chirp line. So our first seismic, seismic reflection line crossing uh, these, these couple of pockmarks right here. And you'll notice a couple of really, really interesting things about this chirp line. So first of all, you can see these depressions in the seafloor that are the pockmarks themselves, beneath which we kind of get these localized high amplitude reflections. And what you can see is that these reflections kind of uh, there's kind of occur in these punctuated events that sort of seem to maybe sort of correlate in between pockmarks, at least on a local scale. And you'll also notice that these uh, these uh, events uh, that we're as we're calling them sort of undergo discrete shifts uh, over time. And there the net migration seems to be uh, southeastward uh, in a lot of these pockmarks, but it's not the discrete shifts are not always to the southeast. So that's also pretty interesting. Zooming out a little bit more, this is one of our multi-channel lines. You can see we got some really nice imaging with our mini sparker kind of going through the northern part of the study area. And you can see these depressions uh, in the seafloor. Each one of these is a pockmark. And beneath each depression, a lot of the times, especially if we cross it just right, you get those high amplitude localized reflections extending into the subsurface. So I'll show you a close up of one of those spots here. And in some cases, again, when we cross the pockmark just right, you can see that those reflections extend uh, pretty far into the subsurface, up to 100 meters in some cases. And based on sedimentation rates from Charlie Paul et al's work, uh, we think that these pockmarks have persisted for something like a million years. Another thing that we notice in our reflection data is we get these sort of high amplitude uh, bright spots, generally kind of on the eastern edge of the pockmark field in a couple of areas. And this appears to be a reverse polarity reflection and crustal scale uh, seismic reflection data here. And beneath that, we get some attenuation of high frequency energy. So these are common, these are all common characteristics of gas, um, the presence of gas. So we're not uh, sure if or how these relate to the pockmarks, but that's something that we're, that we're working on trying to figure out now. 
So take homes for the pockmark part of the festivities today. Uh, our reflection data suggests that these pockmarks have persisted for um, maybe at least a million years, perhaps, in episodic events. They, they also seem to shift uh, in time with a net migration to the southeast in many cases. We're still, like I said, looking at the relationship between those acoustic bright spots, things like faulting uh, and the pockmarks, which may or may not be related. And uh, I won't talk about the core data too much, but just so you know, the core data that we've analyzed so far, this is work in progress. We still have not found any evidence of, of gas or exotic fluids in those cores. So we still don't really have a very good explanation for the pockmarks. Could be a number of different things, and uh, these results are sort of preliminary. So stay tuned. Hopefully in the next year or two, we'll, we'll uh, dig into this a bit more, look at the cores a bit more, and have some more uh, info for you. So the second thing I wanted to talk about was faults and, and uh, other structures in our, in our study area, which is another hazard of potential concern. Uh, so first, here's a map of seismicity uh, in, this, in offshore of South Central California. Here's Monterey Bay and there's Point Conception there. And so what you can see is a lot of the seismicity is onshore kind of along the San Andreas system and the nearshore stuff is um, concentrated on the Hoscar San Gregorio system. And our study areas is offshore here, and I just wanted to circle here the Santa Lucia Bank. And you can maybe even see in this Google Earth image, there's kind of a lineament along the eastern edge of the bank that we were curious at looking at for evidence of activity. The nearest seismicity to Santa Lucia Bank are these two events, uh, mag upper magnitude fives in 1969. And then the biggest event in the general area is this 1927 magnitude seven Lompoc earthquake. And there's two very different locations for this earthquake, given that it's offshore. And so again, we're just kind of interested to see how that um, San Lucia Bank area deformation plays into this. And this is sort of the geologic framework that we were looking at um, when kind of interpreting our seismic reflection data. And this is work done in the 80s, still a very good fr framework from which to, uh, which to use here. Uh, you can see the edge of the escarpment here, the San Lucia Bank Fault is what it's often called in the literature. And I just want you to notice that uh, throughout the San Lucia Bank, uh, we've got some really old tertiary aged, uh, what we believe is um, a uh, former subduction complex that's taught by uh, accretionary prism that's taught by deformed Miocene stratigraphy. And then to the east, we get some younger sediment coming in in the Santa Maria Basin. And then we have little to no uh, quaternary sediment on top of the San Lucia Bank, which is pretty sediment starved. So here again is the San Lucia Bank in a color bathymetry image. You can see it's uplifted right here. And again, along the eastern edge, we've got a nine, the 90 kilometer long San Lucia Bank fault system. And in our surveys, we also noticed that on top of the bank, we've got a couple of prominent scarps that show up, um, as you can see here, really prominently in the Ambari uh, high resolution uh, AUV data. And there's some backscatter uh, colored, colored imagery that just popped in over here. And so uh, what we were looking for in our data was evidence of offset of recently deposited Holocene or Quaternary sediment. So I'll show you a chirp line across these two bank top scarps first. So again, this is an Ambari chirp line using their autonomous underwater vehicle. And a couple things to notice, we do have some fairly significant scarps, um, but they, so those are shown in, in the B and D close-ups here, uh, but they have fairly gentle slopes, just a couple of, uh, couple of degrees um, is typical. Uh, and based on the acoustic reflectivity, they seem to be outcrops of, essentially outcrops of consolidated uh, stratigraphy. And based on our coring attempts, I can assure you that this is very hard and impenetrable rock. Uh, the important thing to notice in this entire slide is that these scarps are, are onlapped by undeformed soft sediment in a couple of places. We have some really good imaging of that. And that uh, sediment also conforms to the underlying uh, bedrock stratigraphy, so it drapes it. And so basically this undeformed drape suggests a lack of recent Holocene to Quaternary activity uh, on these scarps. So once again, just zooming out a little bit here to show a multi-channel line across the edge of the bank and also across one of these bank top scarps. You can see a couple of interesting features here. We've got uh, a pretty prominent unconformity here that kind of rises up to the seafloor and actually forms the escarpment itself along the eastern edge of Santa Lucia Bank. Above that, we've got some deformed sediment and uh, both on top of the bank and also buried to the east of the bank within which there is some faulting. Um, and then what you'll notice is we've got some flat-lying stratigraphy sitting on top of that deformation. So this um, quaternary stratigraphy is undeformed. And then uh, we think this is probably uh, maybe part of that tertiary subduction uh, 
geo, um, accretionary prism complex. And then we think the deformed folds are um, Miocene in age. So uh, lots of deformation here, but all of it is occurring within what we believe is pre quaternary stratigraphy. So here's kind of the composite uh, fault map here. You can, and this is just based on our, uh, our mapping of both the subsurface and also the, the bathymetric compilations. And uh, anything that you see in blue here is within, uh, was our, our structures mapped within pre-quaternary stratigraphy. And the red is quaternary, uh, possible quaternary um, uh, structures. And so basically there's very li little evidence for uh, quaternary fault activity. All the quaternary faults, uh, possible quaternary faults that we map are small offset and or discontinuous. Again, most of the deformation we observe is in that pre-quaternary stratigraphy. Um, there are a couple of caveats though. So this area, this Santa Lucia bank is sediment starved, which means that um, a couple of things. So a lack of quaternary sediment doesn't necessarily mean a lack of quaternary tectonic act activity, but at the same time, if you see a seafloor scarp, that also doesn't necessarily mean it was active in the quaternary. Um, and then finally, you know, our results are consistent with previous work suggesting that the St. Lucia Bank is uplifted tertiary subduction complex and deformed Miocene stratigraphy. And again, a lot of the faulting that we see is kind of within uh, those, those sections. So lots of people to thank, which I don't have time to do. Um, so just take a quick look and thanks. Happy to take uh, questions if we have time. Do we have time for, um one short question, one or two questions. Any questions here? This might be a good time to remind people that um, there's a special interest group on small source seismic uh, studies coming up tomorrow. And uh, I think we'll move on now to the next course, next talk. And we do have um, some time for discussion at the end of this session. So. Um, uh, Donna, I see a question here from Donna Shillington. You want to ask your question? Yes, thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, Maureen. That was a fabulous talk, and what do you think, Donna? That's fabulous. Um, I had a question about your um, pock marks and your super high resolution imaging, and where you showed these kind of discrete shifts. Mm -hmm. I it, but like, how frequently did those shifts occur, and uh, do you think there could be any connection between? kind of a change in the fluid system and faulting? Maybe not based on the second part of your talk. Yeah, that's a really good question, Donna. This is, we're still kind of working on this. Um, we don't have very good constraints on like the sedimentation rate. It, they do seem to happen, you know, we get, there's lots of different shifts and we, you know, we're still looking at like how widely the shifts correlate, whether it's a regional event or if it's just sort of local. My suspicion is that it is related to re some sort of regional process. We've thought of maybe sea level kind of modulating some of those shifts. Um, and as I mentioned, we so far do not have any sort of home run evidence that those pockmarks are even related to fluid or gas at all. Um, it seems like they sort of have to be, but we um, we don't know. <laughs> so stay tuned. Those are, yeah, still kind of preliminary results. We're, hope, we're hoping that, we haven't really sampled the cores yet. We're hoping that the cores will sh sh shed some light onto those uh, those processes a little bit more. That's a really good question. Great, thanks so much. And gosh, with, with that kind of imaging, I'm sure you guys have your work cut out for you. So. Yeah, there's lots of data. <laughs> I, thank you. I see a hand raised. Joan, you have a question? Yeah, this is maybe a related question about the pockmarks. In one image you showed, they looked like they were fairly regularly spaced. Um, yeah. Is that, was yeah. that just unique to that one image you showed? So or they are um, remarkably regularly spaced, but they're not perfectly regularly spaced. So I, I showed in a, a map kind of early on that shows relative pockmark density. And there are some areas that have relatively denser Pock marks, but they're all pretty similarly spaced overall, which is pretty interesting. Um, I will say, and this is qualitative, I'm gonna um, try to do some quantitative, uh, quantitative mapping of this at some point, but um, the areas that do have relatively denser pock marks appear to be kind of occurring in areas that have relatively thicker sediment. So like kind of above like synclinal features or more basin type um, environments, which is interesting. I'm not sure why that is. Um, but yeah, remarkably evenly spaced, but they're not perfectly even, if that makes sense. Thanks. Great talk. 
a follow-up question to that too. Um, are, you know, those pockmarks are just incredibly dense and you have a line around them. Is the absence of pockmark, pockmarks outside that line due to the absence of data or is it a true absence of pockmarks? In that case, it's actually a true absence of pockmarks because we have pretty well imaged uh, with bathymetric data. This has been a multi-year effort to try to get that part of the margin imaged with surface ship multi-beam. And so we're pretty confident that we have uh, imaged the entire pockmark field. That's a really good question. Um, the seismic data coverage is a lot more limited, but you know, if there's a pockmark to be seen on the seafloor, we think we've probably imaged it at this point. Okay. And is there anything extraordinary about that region that stands out or not that you have noticed yet? Not, not particularly. Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a bit, uh, you know, as you maybe saw in, one, in a couple of the seismic lines, there's quite a bit of buried uh, deformation, which is possibly Miocene in age, you know, possibly, you know, gas bearing or, you know, fluid bearing stratigraphy that's buried out there. Um, but that's not, it's not particularly unusual. Okay, now, well, thanks a lot for that fascinating talk. And now we're going to go on to the next talk. And I also think Casey put the link for the um, session on high resolution uh, sources into the into the chat. But now let's move on to uh, Brandy Lentz's talk. And Brandy is a graduate student, although not for much longer. I hear her defense is coming up soon. And she's at Oregon, uh, not Oregon State, Ohio, the Ohio State University, the other OSU. And she'll be talking about some mass transport deposits in high resolution reflection data offshore Oregon. So go ahead, Brandy, and I see your slides. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about mass transport deposits and reflection seismic data. And yeah, I am here defending in about two weeks. So <laughs> I have a lot going on, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started because I have a lot to get through. Um, let's see. So back in 2017, I was part of the early career seismic crews that collected high resolution um, two dimensional seismic data offshore Oregon. Uh, here, I interpreted the data that we collected to answer three main scientific questions. Um, number one, what can reflection seismic data tell us about the kinematics of past submarine landslides? Um, to answer this question, I actually focus on the 44 North slide offshore Oregon, which is the largest blocky slide um, along this margin. Let me see if I can get my laser pointer ready. Um, so here's a map image of that slide. We actually collected seismic data through this landslide, through the blocks themselves, and through the main headscarp here. Um, so I study what the role of this slide is in deforming the adjacent in situ abyssal plane sediment. And you'll notice on this map here, I have drawn a um, interpreted deformation zone. Um, so a zone of in situ sediment that has been deformed by the impact of these blocks. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, number two is I want to see if we can back calculate landslide velocity based on this strain field induced upon impact. And here is just a quick image of that deformation zone in the seismic profile. And I'll show this in a little bit later in the talk. Um, so to answer this question, um, I again focus just on this slide using the information gathered from the reflection seismic data to determine how fast this slide was. Um, and finally, what is the history of slope failures along the broader Oregon margin? Um, previous work has shown distinct morphological differences between landslides in the north versus the south. Um, I explore these differences in the subsurface and discuss what could be the causes of um, some of these differences that we observed. So what is the significance of all this work? I'm pretty sure everybody here in the geohazard session kind of has an idea of the significance that submarine landslides can create and or amplify tsunami events causing destruction of life and property. So pretty important to understand these kind of things. Um, landslide tsunamis depend heavily on how much and how fast the sediment has moved though. The how much question can be relatively easy to constrain. However, the how fast question is usually much more difficult to answer and that's what we try to accomplish here. Uh, so here's my study site, uh, the Cascadia Margin Offshore Oregon. You can see the Juan de Fuca plate subducting under the North American plate. The main sediment output here is from the Columbia River dumping into the Astoria fan via the Astoria Canyon system here. Um, right along the deformation front 
of central Oregon, and here's a closer zoom in of central Oregon here, you'll see the huge landslide blocks and a prominent cookie cutter shaped headscarp, which is uh, imaged even closer here. Um, again, this is called the 44 North slide. So I focus most of my talk on this eastern half of the seismic line that was collected through this slide. So here's that eastern half of the seismic line. And as you can see here, the headscarp is imaged, um, as well as the blocks and a beautiful complex zone directly seaward of those blocks. And I'll zoom in a little bit closer. Um, so here's that zoom in on that deformation zone again. So I immediately compared to this feature to what I've observed when shoveling snow or watching a snow plow um, in the winter. It literally looks like a snow plow has come through here and just plowed through these sediments and deforming them westward. Um, so you can see the beautiful compression here in the form of multiple folding, um, multiple thrusting, and even some fluid migration within this zone. Um, previously, this zone was actually interpreted to be evidence for a much larger mega slide. So it was originally interpreted to be a deposit of a landslide. Um, however, their interpretation was based on much older unmigrated data. Um, with this newer high resolution data, we can clearly see that the zone actually consists of in situ deformation. Since we can trace this strata seaward where they continue undeformed out to the west. We also suggest that this deformation occurred nearly instantaneously um, since the sedimentary drape above this zone is uh, mostly undeformed. So calculations were then performed for theoretical pore pressure developed immediately after the deposition of the landslide blocks, assuming hydrostatic conditions prior to loading. Um, this here shows the instant increase in pore pressure in the shallow sediments, increasing that pore pressure above the lithostatic stress to a depth um, that defines that slip plane observed in the seismic data. Um, so this increase in pore pressure may aid in actually driving these thrusts and these folds as you move westward. From there though, we begin to have even more questions such as why does this deformation zone seem to stop abruptly about 10 kilometers away? Um, I wonder, can this strain field give us more information about the forces or perhaps even the velocity associated with this slide? So can we actually back calculate velocity based on the amount of strain observed in the seismic data? Well, first, in order to determine slide velocity, we must calculate the lateral and normal um, basal shear stresses associated with initiating deformation across this zone. I used an analytical model of deformation within a rectangular region, assuming the upper boundary is a traction-free surface and subjected to the lithostatic stresses and a constant horizontal um, tectonic force here, which is represented by C. And this tectonic force is intended to replicate the impact force of the blocks. Uh, I then estimated force by using a Hooke's Law approach and treated the sediments like an elastic spring. Um, preliminary results show that this calculated force was enough to induce deformation throughout this entire observed zone. From there, I calculated work and work is the change in kinetic energy. So if we assume the kinetic energy prior to this event was at zero, then we can treat the work calculated as the final kinetic energy. So by rearranging the kinetic energy equation, we can derive the velocity. Of course, this calculation assumes many things. So this is just kind of a back of envelope calculation that confirms whether this slide was fast or slow moving. And the velocity that we actually calculate here is probably closer to the maximum velocity. Preliminary results show that the landslide must have moved with speeds of at least 38 meters per second. Um, for context, the 1929 Grand Banks event was clocked at about 28 meters per second, and that was based on the breakage of numerous telecommunication cables. So 38 meters per second is not completely out of the realm of possibilities here. Um, using methods such as these, it, it might be possible to use this as a tool for estimating slide velocity and their tsunami potential globally where in situ deformation exists, and we're especially excited to see what the seismic data across the uh, new Uanu slide north of Oahu, which was recently crossed during a 2018 Langseth cruise. So super excited to see what that, what that seismic data shows to see if there is any in-situ deformation elsewhere that we can use these methods um, with. So to check the reliability of these velocity estimates, we also used a mechanical model to calculate velocity based on just the geometry of the system itself. Um, so the dimensions of the blocks and the slope and ignoring that strain field completely. So our mechanical model that was modified from Herleman et al. in 2000 and incorporates uh, many forces such as um, the force of friction, the weight of the blocks, the buoyancy forces, drag, 
um, and also incorporates the possible effects of hydroplaning. Um, this model estimated speeds of up to 60 meters per second, and it implies that the buoyancy forces were sufficient enough to uplift the landslide block, causing it to lose contact with the surface or hydroplane. Um, so for context, again, previous modeling work shown that the Storega slide off Norway traveled with speeds up to 60 meters per second. Um, the Storega slide disintegrated upon failure, unlike this 44 North slide. However, the Storega traveled down a slope of, on average, about half a degree. And the slopes here offshore Oregon, where the 44 North slide traveled, um, were about 13 degrees. So it's much steeper here. So um, it's completely possible that the 44 North slide traveled at similar speeds as the Storega was modeled. What I think is really interesting is that this model showed that the blocks did indeed hydroplane, and that helps explain how these blocks remained intact um, and, and remained with such large dimensions and sharp, sharp angular edges as they traveled um, quite far from the source, and in some cases up to 20 kilometers away, and they didn't disintegrate upon failure. So how unique was the 44 North slide? Um, this 44 North slide is not actually unique to this part of the margin. Um, there have been at least four similar events indicated along the southern Oregon margin. Two great examples of these can be seen here in line six from the cruise EW9414. Um, this line was reprocessed by students in the Oregon State University's crustal seismology class. Um, it is so beautiful. I don't know if you can see here, but there is... Um, possible in situ deformation that looks remarkably sim similar to the 44 North slide. And you could see those buried blocks here um, towards the east of that. And then even further, you can see another possible zone of in situ deformation that could have been produced by, uh, again, another blocky slide. So um, this, this 44 North slide is not entirely unique to this part of the margin. However, it is restricted to this part of the margin. And to date, we haven't seen this in situ deformation anywhere else globally with the exception of a smaller scale example in a lake in Switzerland. Um, so again, we're super interested to see what the new Hawaii data might show next to those large um, landslide blocks there to see if we see anything similar. So what is the history of the slope failures along the broader Oregon margin? Um, Mikadu et al. in 2000 observed distinct morphology and land bathymetry for Oregon. As opposed to more dominantly blocky landslides in the south. Their study was biased to recent events though because they only used what could be observed on the current sea floor. So we added to their study by looking at landslides in the subsurface which we call MTDs or mass transport deposits um, by using the seismic data that was collected back in 2017. Um, so here's a map here and I apologize that this map might look a little bit smaller for for some of you but the uh, the green circles here represent a location where Mekadu et al. Uh, identified a landslide on the seafloor. And all of the red circles are where we identified an MTD along um, these seismic lines that we analyzed. And this line here, the 44.85 degrees north, is what we're using as our cutoff. So everything north of that, we're considering northern Oregon margin. Everything south of that, is considered southern Oregon margin. And this is the same cutoff that Mikadu et al. used for their um, seafloor study. So we actually identified 133 MTDs in the subsurface using a three-part criterion. Each MTD must be thicker than the limit of separability with the top and bottom boundary clearly resolved. There must be enough um, separation from the top and bottom reflectors to observe the seismic facies of the internal body. And the observed seismic facies must be chaotic, discontinuous, semi-transparent, or transparent, which is just common characteristics of MTDs. We then went ahead and categorized the MTDs as blocky or disintegrative. We defined the blocky MTDs as regions that display chaotic and sometimes bright seismic reflectors. A great example of that can be seen here in the seismic profile. Here you see some bright and chaotic um, seismic reflectors here, and this is a blocky MTD. We define the disintegrative MTDs as regions that display discontinuous and sometimes continuous semi-transparent and or transparent reflectors and had an absence of blocks. So here in this example, you'll see that there are two disintegrative MTDs below that blockier one above. We also calculated a maximum thickness of the deposit as seen in the two-dimensional seismic profiles. So then I went ahead and plotted our results. Um, here on the y-axis is just latitude. It went from 43 and a half degrees north to 46 degrees north. 
Um, and then on the x-axis, I have depth in meters below seafloor. Again, I use that same cutoff that Mikadu et al. used of the 44.85 degrees north. So everything above this line is northern Oregon. Everything below this line is southern Oregon. The yellow circles indicate a disintegrative MTD. The blue squares indicate a blocky MTD. And then you'll notice there's some red diamonds here um, that just indicate a rotational slump that we saw along the slope on some of these seismic profiles. We just wanted to indicate them as a different category. So as you can see here, the north um, had a lot more MTDs. We actually identified 101 here. They were mostly disintegrative and the thicknesses ranged from seven and a half to 70 meters. So on average, about 20 meters um, thick. And in the south, the MTDs were much less common. We only um, found about 32 of them compared to the 101 in the north. The MTDs here, you can see they, they are um, mostly disintegrative. However, they, they consist of more um, blocky MTDs than they do in the north. And more importantly, I think the thicknesses range here from 13 and a half to over 410 meters. On average, the thicknesses were over 60 meters. So that's pretty significant. So what might be explaining these differences that we see here? Um, well, right here in site 892, ODP leg 1 of 46 collected shear strength data. Um, and this site was on the southern Oregon margin um, on Hydrate Ridge. And if you plot that shear strength data that was collected here with depth, you can see here that the shear strength um, of the southern Oregon margin sediments are much stronger than the passive margins throughout the world, which are, are, which are plotted here in blue. And you could argue are even stronger than some of the active margins throughout the world, which are plotted in red. Enhanced shear strength could be evidence of seismic strengthening. Seismic strengthening can occur in sediments exposed to earthquake shaking that dewaters and densifies the sediment. Therefore, it decreases their risk of failure. The sediments of the northern margin, margin though, would likely experience similar earthquake shaking episodes as the south. However, the higher sedimentation rates associated with the Astoria fan might actually be offsetting any of those potential seismic strengthening gains. Another explanation for the enhanced shear strength could be that this part of the margin has experienced enhanced uplift, which would expose deeper, more consolidated sediments. Um, this could be the result of a subducted topographic feature, such as a ridge or a seamount province. Regardless of the explanation, though, there is strong evidence to suggest that the sediment here on the southern Oregon margin is indeed strong. So what might be the implications of having strong sediment? While stronger sediments can produce thicker cohesive landslides and could generate larger tsunamis if they also have a high initial acceleration and maximum velocity, which our calculations and models suggest that the slides here are capable of moving at high speeds. A higher frequency of slope failure in the north may not actually indicate an increased risk of tsunami as these failures tend to be smaller and less cohesive. The, frequency, uh, the frequent occurrences of submarine landslides in the north actually might lessen the chances of a larger cohesive slide with the more tsunami generating potential that is observed in the south. So again, the implications here is that the southern organ margin does indeed consist of stronger sediments, and that could mean that it's at higher risk of a landslide induced tsunami. And with that, I want to give a special thank you to the scientists and crew of the early career um, chief scientist training crews of 2017 um, for the collection and the processing of this wonderful data set that's uh, publicly available to anybody. And with that, I welcome any questions. Oh, I've just unmuted. Joe, do you have a question? Your hand's been up. No, okay, well, we have uh, several questions here for Brandy. There's a question from Amir Salari. Thanks for the great talk. I'm wondering if there's been any numerical tsunami modeling for the 44 North slide. Yeah, um, back in 2004, Mikadu and Watts, they, they kind of had a study where they looked at uh, the tsunami risk of the Oregon margin and they modeled that this slide could have pr produced a tsunami of over 42 meters in height. Um, that was back in 2004. Another question for you, Brandy, from uh, Diego Mercera. Um, have you seen this type of MTD closer to the coast? 
Uh, I have not to date. I haven't seen anything like this other than a smaller scale example in a lake in Switzerland. Um, but I'm curious to see what the data off Hawaii will look like. But yeah, it's, it's just pretty remarkable. I've only seen these kind of MTDs in, in Oregon, in particular this segment of Oregon. Um, I'll comment briefly on that. The Roloco slide off of Chile is very similar in size to the 44 degree north. And it um, does not have this type of um, large, extensive um, in-situ deformation, although there is a suggestion that there might be some in-situ deformation, although it does not have um, this type of seismic data. It only has 3.5 kilohertz seismic data. But I think it is something um, worth looking for. Uh, more questions for you, Brandy. Um, Jackie kaplan Arba has a question, no, fascinating talk. That's not a question. But Joan, um, Joan is asked, Joan Gomberg is asking, do you have any constraints on the ages of the slides? Um, the ages of the slides are poorly constrained. Um, I believe actually your paper talks about the ages a little bit more depth and um, on, on, I can't remember the ages yeah. of the the, um, the eight, there are no direct measurements. Um, there are ages based on estimates of um, the sedimentation rate. And there are, there's pretty good constraints for the southern section on the relative ages of the slides due to their relative position in the, um, in the trench strata. There's a question from Morelia. Um, Thanks for the great talk. Could any morphological parameters, slope, angle, such as slope or angle, um, influence the occurrence of blocky versus disintegrative slides? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I would like to look at, um, you know, more parameters of the morphology in some of these deposits. I know the these slopes here are, are a little bit steeper, I believe, in the southern part of the margin where we're having block here, but I don't know if there's any correlation between the steepness of slope versus what kind of morphology of the deposit you're gonna you're gonna see. But that, that's interesting to look at though. And then what we'll have one last question uh, before we move on to the next presentation um, from Jakob Gerson. Great talk, Brandy. Did you look at the slide numbers per, pro, per profile kilometer to make sure that the frequency is not biased by the density of seismic lines? Yeah, so I was a little bit worried about the, the biasness of the frequency of lines because um, overall, the northern Oregon margin is, is imaged a lot more. However, that's why I focused on just this singular survey and I tried to um, I tried to select lines where I can compare the distances of the seismic lines between the two margins. Um, and actually in this study that I did, I ended up using more line kilometers in the south than the north. And I still got less MTDs in the south than the north. So I think it's a, it's a good comparative study. But that's a good question because that was one of the first questions I had before I, before I began this study was I didn't want to be biased with the amount of data that we had. Okay, oh, we'll have one more question for you, Brandy, and then we have to move on to the next uh, next presentation. I think we are cutting into our more general discussion at the end, but um, for all of the MTDs you've identified, how far seaward from the deformation front do they extend? Are they similar to the 44 North slide or is there a range of distances? Um, if we're talking about run out distances, I know um, on the south, you can, you can see that these, these landslides off of the deformation front seem to be running out pretty far, like tens of kilometers. Um, but in the north, the majority of the landslides that we found were within, um, they were confined within like little mini basins. Um, so I didn't really compare like run out lengths between the north and the south, just because they both occurred on, on very different kind of depositional environments. Now, I think we do have to move on to the, the next talk. We have a short talk now by um, Diego Mercera, who is at, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Serema Mediterranée in France, the Sophie Antipoli. So, um, Diego, Mayor Brand, if you, yeah, you stop sharing your screen. Are you ready to share your screen? Yep, looks good. 
Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation uh, for the organizers to, to share our research in, in Nice. So now we move to, to Europe. And uh, so the, my talk is about an offshore side effect on the, on, uh, the Nice uh, Côte d'Azur airport slow. So now we are moving uh, to a much, uh, let's say, close to the, to the coast the scale. Here is, there's no subduction zone, so there are, there, we are not uh, facing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, big earthquakes or, or this type of, of things. But in, in any case, there's, there are a lot of uh, risk, seismic risks uh, in the area because of the, well, the population. Um, so here is a picture of the, of the area. The airport of, of Nice is the, was built on the coast of the of the city. Here is the city. Have you see? Uh, do you see my mouse moving on, on the screen or not? Yes, we do. Oh, but there, okay. for me, there is an issue. Is uh, yeah. oh yeah? Can you go to slideshow? Yeah. yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. No problem. Yeah. yeah. Now it's okay. It's better. No. Yeah. So. So this is the, the Nice airport. So uh, here is the, the city of Nice that it's, uh, uh, so was built in the, on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Here you see the mountain ranges, the Alps mountain ranges. Uh, so it's close to, to Italy. Um, and here there is uh, the Var River. So the Var River, where there are many other valleys in, inside the city where the city was built. And so the seismic uh, side effects on, the, on this uh, area are, are quite high for the metropolitan area of France. Uh, and so uh, in, in our institute and with, oh, sorry, in our institute and with close cooperation with the GeoAsur laboratory of uh, the University of uh, Côte d'Azur, um, the Earth Science Department, so it's called GeoAsur of the university. So we, we are a lot of seismologists and geotechnicians working on the on seismic hazard assessment of the area. Um, so this is all, all my slides. I, I have just a couple of slides. I, I want to uh, then, if you, if you like to discuss a little bit more, and I give you the, the reference of our uh, publication of last year uh, concerning these uh, amplifications that have seen on the on the airport slope. So this in close collaboration of uh, Francois Courboulex and all the other authors that uh, helped a lot to, to install the stations and to, to carry out also the processing of data. So uh, what we have seen in this area, so we installed uh, for a couple of years, unfortunately we had some problems with the so we don't have a lot of continuous data uh, from, from the stations. So we stole a broadband station just close to the, um, to the airport's tracks uh, at 18 meter depth in order to see what were the, the amplifications that were um, recorded here in the airport slope of uh, seismicity uh, that happens well, in, in, all around the Alps or in, the, in Italy, <coughs> coming from Italy. But Diego, also the uh, Diego. Oh, yes. uh, I'm yes? still seeing your first slide, but um, is oh, it what you no, know? yes, I mean the second one. I, I think so. Yeah, so maybe I can. Uh, I can do it. Or? Well, yes, yes. If you like, you have your the presentation in PDF. No. Uh, yes. Let me see if now is the second one or not? Yes, that's the second one now. Ah, great, great. Okay. So I yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is the so this is the, the airport uh, uh, tracks where and here is the airport slope. The station was installed uh more or less uh, 500 meters from the coast in uh, in the uh, outpour um, uh, let's say the continental shelf of the area here is the var river delta and here you see the all the the bathymetry the, the high resolution bathymetry of the area and where you see here in the in 1979 the uh, a catastrophic event a big landslide occurred well a big uh, for the area <laughs> a quite uh, impressive landslides of 10 million cubic meters uh, material that were run up here. And so it caused a, a small tsunami that went to the, to the coast, and 
well, it propagated more to the south, and then uh, so it has some catastrophic consequences uh, in the in the city of Antibes, that is in the uh, ten kilometers from the south of the of Nice. Um, so and there were fatalities also there. So uh, unfortunately, it was it happened in. Uh, so in winter time, so if it were in uh, in summer time, with all the all the beaches that were uh, that are crowded in the area, that it would be it would have been much more um, uh, catastrophic for the. So uh, the idea is to to study and to understand why this happens. So the, there is a lot of uh, uh, let's say um, controversies uh, about the causes uh, of these landslides. There are some people, so it's looks that there are no there were not earthquakes happening there at that time it was october uh, 79 uh, but the role of fluids are, are um, uh, so the, there was a, a lot of rain that's uh, the last uh, the previous winter so maybe uh, but the causes are not are not well understood especially because at that time the airport was trying to to construct a kind of harbor here so there was also an, um, maybe an anthropic component and then that was uh, maybe the cause of this uh, catastrophic uh, landslide. So the idea is to see uh, the, the whole, let's say, idea of the project is to, to try to uh, assess if the uh, uh, potential earthquakes happening there uh, can not trigger, a, a uh, let's say, a landslide and uh, a catastrophic tsunami that may, that may affect all the coastal areas that are really crowded, especially in uh, uh, summer times. So this is a, a picture of the broadband sensor that was installed for, let's say, two years in uh, from 2016 to 2018, with some periods with with uh, data gaps uh, from the area. But what, at least we have recorded some uh, so some earthquakes in order to to try to understand these site effects. Uh, this is a picture of the seismological network, the French seismological network, uh, where you see all the triangles, the white triangles are the stations, the permanent stations. Can you advance? We still see, we are seeing your slide oh, number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you go to... I'm really yes. sorry for that, but I don't have much slides, so I will do it like this. Okay. Oh, now it's okay? Yes. Okay. So while well, it looks like <laughs> if the time, so the time is pressing, so I will go fast. So this is the, the seismological network, and here is the Prima station. Uh, the Prima station, uh, and I, I will show data from Prima uh, regarded. So compare with the three accelerometric networks of the of the accelerometric uh, permanent accelerometric network of France. They are called SLAF and CAD and Co. These uh, are less than. Uh, let's say one kilometer away from the premium station in order to calculate the spectral ratios from the earth, from the recorded earthquakes in the offshore stations uh, with respect to recorded earthquake the same earthquakes on the on onshore stations so this is one example of uh, one local earthquake well local let's say regional earthquakes 100 kilometers on to the north it's called Digne earthquakes in 2016 and so the first uh, two traces, so in the... In the go, go to the next left. slide. Oh. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, is it okay there? Have you, are you seeing the size? Yes, program? yeah, it's good. Yeah, okay, great. So in, on, the, on the left, we have the, let's say the raw data, uh, the broadband data, uh, the first, uh, on, on the right, you have the low pass um, filter data at two hertz. So the low frequencies are on the on the left, on the right. Sorry. So uh, you see uh, the first the first two seismograms are the Prima stations compared to the old stations. So NCAD and Co and SLAF are the closest stations to this to this one, less than one kilometer away. And you will quickly see that there are some kind of a, a strong side effect, especially at low frequencies. Uh, around one hertz, that the so the compare the the signal recorded in the prima stations with the stations other stations recorded from the city, you see that there is not at all uh, low frequencies in the data, but there is a, a strong uh, side effect at low frequencies in the in the prima offshore stations. So this is not uh, this is not uh, good in order to to study uh, the let's say the, the, the stability of the slope 
because uh, so you, as you can see here from this picture uh, you see for four different earthquakes uh, the, the the spectral ratios between the premium stations and the stations on on shore uh, I I advise you to just uh, again can you advance uh, one slide yeah yeah sorry <laughs> I'm really sorry for that so so here are the spectral ratios. So uh, please look at the just the, the red curves that are the spectral ratio from Prima and one of the closest stations onshore. And you see here the, the strong amplification up to 15. So this is quite, quite high, around one hertz and, and other peaks of resonance peaks uh, at much higher frequencies and some uh, special features near 10 hertz in, in some, uh, for some of the earthquakes. But this is, the, the, the main peak is around one hertz, and this is uh, surely related to the amplification of, of the sedimentary, uh, um, let's say, coverage of the of the, um, of the of the of the area of the slope that it was constructed. Uh, so there are quaternary sediments there that are overlying the, the, the Pliocene conglomerates that are the, the bedrock of the of the area. Um, so I think that I arrive to the conclusions. I guess that I need to put the conclusions <laughs> again like this. Oh. So the conclusions, uh, we have seen a strong side effects in the outer shelf offshore the Nice Côte d'Azur International Airport. Uh, well, I, I couldn't show all the geophysical studies of the area, but we have many geophysical studies, the seismic lines, the sparkler lines, uh, H over V ratios uh, from noise data, so reveal significant sediment thickness in the area, around 100 meters of uh, Pleistocene sediments um, that are prone to, uh, to shaking triggered landslide. Uh, we have done also numerical simulations uh, in 2D. Uh, the preliminary results of these simulations do not account for the observed amplifications, so we are thinking that we need to, to, do, to carry out 3D numerical simulations to understand and to better uh, explain the, the observations. Uh, and this is, well, to, 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 to change, so this is really important to account for uh, offshore site effects in microsonation studies, especially relevant to near shore infrastructures, as for example, uh, an international airport. Okay, so I, I, I put here the, our publication it was last year, uh, so you have the, and yeah, one announcement, so we are looking for a, so we have a PhD fellowship, um, so we have a PhD project with a close collaboration with USU, so we are looking for candidates, if you know uh, some candidates that want to come to the Côte d'Azur in order to study this interesting site, uh, so we are pleased to, to receive applications. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Diego. Do we have any questions for Diego? Uh, if we don't have any questions, I do. Are there any questions for any of the other speakers? And we will be completely cut off in um, eight minutes. If there aren't any other are there any any additional questions if there aren't any additional questions i would really like to thank all the speakers in this session um we saw a really wide range of um approaches a full spectrum use of marine seismological and geodetic tools and how they can be applied to a wide range of natural hazards, you know, from the seafloor geodesy and broadband seismology to a very high resolution subsurface imaging. So I think we really had a nice cross section um, of techniques and hazards. And um, so again, thank you to all the speakers, to all the participants, to everyone who asked questions. And um, I also would like to thank Casey for organizing this meeting and the staff at IRIS who helped support it. And I'd also especially like to thank Anne Bessel, who really was the uh, driving force in organizing this session. She did most of the heavy lifting. So um, let's just give a hand to uh, all the speakers and um, to everyone who made this session possible. <laughs>